Good afternoon. The November member meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education is called to order. I'd like to welcome everyone that is here today. I want to introduce to our board members Danny Zeck, who is uh, the new representative. It was elected yesterday as the representative from District 1. Welcome. We look forward to working with you, sir. Uh, at this time, Mr. Jones is on his way, but we have nine board members present. Uh, the mission state the mission of the Kansas State Board of Education is to prepare, prepare Kansas students for lifelong success through rigorous quality academic instruction, career training, and character development according to each student's gifts and talents. Our vision is for Kansas to lead the world in the success of each student. At this time, will you please pause for a moment of silence? And now, would you please join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, it's time to approve the agenda. Are there changes to the agenda recommended? Michelle. Oh, no, yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Chairman Porter. I just, um, I'm just gonna pull um, C, D, E, and F off of the consent. And then, um, mm -hmm. and then if, we, if, if I can just make a statement to the board um, uh, on a more personal note, because it, it, it kind of, talks about the things, maybe to open up discussion for things that are going to be on the board, either talked about today or next month, if that's possible. Okay, the, uh, during, uh, during uh, uh, our section about future agenda items will be the appropriate time to do that. Future agenda items? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Be the time to, so which numbers are pulling off, C, D, E, and F? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. Okay, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Gene and Betty. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Uh, that's 9-0. There's going to be two motions on the, uh, on the minutes. Uh, for, first of all, we need to approve the October minutes. And then a uh, correction needs to be made on the already, already approved September minutes. Uh, and so there'll be a motion uh, to, to correct that. But the first thing we need to do is a motion to approve the October minutes. Dina and Betty, all in favor? All opposed? Motion carries 9-0. And the September, uh, this is, is to, to uh, correct. It's a correcting amendment for a uh, correcting motion for the September. And Michelle is going to make that motion. It is moved to amend the approved minutes from September 14th, 2022, page two, to reflect that Dina, uh, Dr. Dina Horse voted in opposition of the proposed Keisha Amendment and not Mrs. Melanie Cox, um, okay. which was a clerical error. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, uh, Melanie seconds that motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Nine to zero, and it is time for the commissioner's report. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good to see all of you. I know some of you had a, do we call it a short night or a long night? Uh, however you look at it, it was probably both, right? Um, but um, uh, good to see all of you. You know, today, um, I'm going to do a little bit of a walk down memory lane to give some credit to you that I don't think you get very often. And I'm going to get some credits to some people that used to sit in your seat, but no longer do. Sally Koppel, Ken Willard, 
John, and I'm looking because Sally would have been over here. And Carolyn would have been right there uh, at, at the end of her term. And John Bacon would have been right there. And Ken Miller would have been right there. And their work, along with your work, combined work of those boards, past and, and current, and soon to be future, have done some remarkable things. I'm going to go through that because I don't think most of the public know some of the things that you have done. And then issue some challenges that we have in the future. As we look as we look ahead, um, so thank you to all ten of you. Thanks to Sally and to John and to Ken and certainly to Carolyn for their leadership in some of this work. So, as we always start with this vision of what is it to lead the world and the success of each student, and you know just some remarkable shots here of some kids that we th as we think about Kansas kids and all the things that they're that they're doing uh, how do we how do we in, in, get the metrics up to lead the world and how do we do that with the success of each each child well very early on as you develop the mission and vision you developed of course the definition that says successful high successful students graduate from high school let's start with that graduate from high school, and then they go on to execute their individual plan of study in a post-secondary institution or the attainment of an industry-recognized credential or the workforce without the need for remediation. Now, there's some skills that those people that, and some of you, worked on. Academic. You don't get enough credit for the academic work that you've put in over those years. Cognitive, technical, employability, civic engagement. I don't think there's enough credit that's been given to the work. So let's talk about what was the first thing the board did after the adoption of a vision and this definition, which, by the way, took several months. Right, Janet? That was not done. We argued about every, every word on both of those pages. All right? But after that, the, the next thing this board did was to charge the agency and said, we want to establish higher standards in English language arts, mathematics, and science, and yes, social studies. Social studies gets no credit, and since I'm a social studies person, I gotta put that out there because it's not federally mandated. It's only state mandated. So you don't get to see any comparisons with states on that. Establish high standards in those areas. And then establish high cut scores. Where's the level that we want kids to be? That was the first thing after the vision and the definition that the board did. Seems like just yesterday. And then some outside agencies have reported on that. Did you know that in 2009, when Education Next reported, they gave us a D in our standards? Janet will remember that. They gave us a D in the rigor of our English language arts, math, and science standards. In 2017, Again, after the vision and after the definition, they regraded us as an A. From a D to an A, in the level of rigor of the standards that we expect students to achieve in school. A little bit, you have some of these charts, by the way, because I just thought as we go through, especially some of these where we're going to show our data, that it would be beneficial. This isn't the entire PowerPoint, but you, you obviously get that electronically too. In fact, Education Next in 2017 said, when you account for every grade level and every subject that we rank six, they, would, they ranked us six in the country in the level of rigor. You can see A, 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 B plus, A, and said, according to NAEP, your standards are 2.42 percentage higher than the NAEP. And you can see the states in green were the states that they gave an A to. I'm just revisiting because that was the first step. Go establish high standards that we want our kids to achieve and then the cut scores that are going to be there. Here's the cut scores. This is NAEP. The, by the way, Education Next and NAEP, we have no control over. These, aren't, these are groups that look at all 50 states. Where's Kansas? I know it's small, right? 
How about right over here? That's the top. This is eighth grade reading. Highest standards in the country by the cut scores. These are the cut scores, right, where we, where we measure this assessment. Six highest standards, just the standards themselves, top cut score. How about in mathematics, eighth grade mathematics? Top, highest cut score for a reason, for a reason that our kids then could execute any plan that they wanted to execute if they had these skills. That's the reason. That's what drove the board you to do this. That was the very first thing, establish high standards and high cut scores. And you did just that. We expect every school to achieve at this level. We expect every student to rise to this level. That was what was done. So let's take a look. Let's start to take an in-depth look then at where we're at and what you currently are doing and then some challenges for what I think we're going to need to do in the future. So let's take a look at state assessments, 10th graders, and level one, two, three, and four. The first graph you see, and you have this chart in front of you also, it's, it, it looks all, I'm going to build it out. This is language arts. I scored in level one to graduation, predictability to graduation. Kansas kids, not Massachusetts kids or California kids. This is not what we estimate. These are Kansas kids. Here's mathematics. All right, this is two graduation. So here's what I want to show you. A student that scored in level two graduated at 10% higher than kids in level one. Do you see that? That's important because what we know about level one, do you know what our descriptor is of level one? I know Ann knows it well. Our descriptor of level one says this. A student has a limited ability to go on to graduation and go to post-secondary. Not an impossible, but it limits. And you can clearly see that, right? Just by going to level two. By going to level three, graduation, you only get a 5% difference. You double that going from one, those in two versus three. And when you go to four, there's a 2% difference. All right? Kansas kids taking a look at how they graduate. Now let's see how they did after graduation. Level one students, these, this is language arts and here's mathematics. This is how they scored in 10th grade on that assessment. So again, look, there's a 25% difference of kids in level two versus kids in level one. Meaning 25% more kids in that level two went on to earn a certificate, an associate degree, baccalaureate, master's, PhD, professional degree. That doesn't go down very much going from two to three. See, level three kids was 23% difference over level two. It's not nearly as high when you get to level four. As you know, you set 95% as the goal for high school graduation for every school district. And you've set 70% as the post-secondary effective rate for school districts and for students. So as you think about that, come back, look at the difference between level two kids and level three kids and level one kids. This is academically how they score relative to then what goes on afterwards. Now let me get a little bit more detailed with you. Let's break up those same, same group of kids. Let's break them up now into lower one. So we, we took the four levels and we broke them in half. That makes sense? Lower one, upper one, lower two. Here's language arts scores. Same 10th grade assessment, same group of kids. This same group, we're just now subdividing it out into upper, and here's mathematics. All right, now clearly look, if you're in the lower part of one, Look at the difference between even lower one to upper one in terms of do I graduate from high school? That's, that's the quick. So if you look, only about 69% of those in the lowest part of level one graduate high school were 80% of those in upper one graduate high school. And then you can see it starts to really level off the graduation does in level three and four. And here's 
post-secondary success, first measured uh, by taking a look at how they scored in language arts, and then mathematics. So your dark bars are always the score in language arts, and your orange bars are always the score in mathematics. Again, see the major difference between post-secondary success in lower levels of each category to upper levels until you get really to three, and it starts to level off. This is our data. We have a question from Betty. Okay. Okay, we'll wait. Okay. Now, you'll want to know, then, okay, that just tells you if a kid scored in level two or what happened, right? Did they, did they graduate? Go on. This is about 70,000 Kansas kids. It's two grade levels. We'll add another cohort to it. Next year will be over 100,000. But I don't look for it to change too much. So how many kids then were in each of these levels? Ready for this? Unacceptable. When we know what the outcomes are, if we can move kids toward level three and level two. So what you're seeing again in the dark is the percent of students in both of those cohorts that scored in each of those levels. Does that make sense? 8% of the two years of those kids scored in the bottom of level one. Do you remember what, what then prediction is? That 8% in the bottom of level one graduates under a 70% rate for those kids. Th only 3% in mathematics. So a small number of kids are in the bottom of level one, but a relatively large number of kids are in the top of level one. So when academic performance starts to then give a prediction to do I graduate high school and do I go on after high school, we really need to pay attention to this. You know, last month I said to you, anyone that's saying level two kids are failing need to stop doing that. And that's clear on this. But you can see that we have way too many kids in level one. And what would it take to move some of the level two kids to three? And what would it take to move some of the kids to level one? So, as you know, since that initial time of setting the standards and the cut scores, what have you done about academics since then? There's some, I think, would say, or at least a well, little bit, because it's even hard to read about the work that you do sometimes. Well, they're doing nothing about academics. Uh, Janet probably reads that sometimes, right? Doing nothing. Well. Here's what you did with the Kansas legislature. Jim Porter sat on this, uh, uh, helped co-chair this and did work on this. And, and Dina, you and Ben worked hard. Jim McNeese before that as liaisons. You established with their assistance a position here at KSDE on dyslexia and very strict standards on screening. Michelle, you were instrumental on that too about Let's find the kids with dyslexia. Let's make sure we're using science of reading. Let's really be intentional about this. That work is currently going on. What else did you do? You took the ESSER funds given to you as discretionary funds around learning loss, and you put the vast majority of that. Sunflower Summer is a great program, but it's peanuts compared to this amount of money that you poured in to training of all teachers, all teachers, all school districts, pre-service teachers, college professors in the science of reading and mathematics. That's going on as we speak and will be going on through 24. Ask any teacher, that's not easy training. It's, it's two years of training, it's rigorous, why? Because we wanna move these kids to a higher academic level. That's what you did. That's not even the preview. You know, I, I gave a lot of credit to Ken Willard and John Bacon and Carolyn and Sally and all of you but they were gone when you did this. This is what you did, and that's currently going on. When would we start to see those results? Not immediate, but we should see some really good results when we have all that training done. Science of reading, science of math, I, I, I got to set in some of the people that were working on the mathematics training a couple weeks ago. It's, it's outstanding work, and uh, if you have a couple of uh, hours, not being facetious. If you have many hours and like to go through any of that training, uh, we, we, can, we can hook you up. We can do that. 
Now, there's something else. I want to come back to this chart. I mentioned this last time. Why in the heck are kids in level one who are limited by our own definition? By the way, just let me go through those definitions for you again. Student in level one has a limited ability to go on to graduate and go to post-secondary. Student in level two shows a basic ability academically to do that. Students in level three have an effective ability, and students in level four have an excellent opportunity to do that. Why are any students then in level one able to go on to post-secondary if they have a limited academic ability to do that? And why in level four do 17% of those kids not go on? Because they have an excellent, they're scoring over 30 on the ACT, by the way. You've seen, I've shown you that comparison. Why? Because that's not the only variable. Because that's not the only variable. And that's why we have to be, if we're thinking about the success of kids, we have to look at all the variables that lead to success. Kansas can competencies. Our work with KU said, and we're going to spend some time on this, said these skills in combination, we know this. When we were out at Hayes for the Governor's Council, Hayes Chamber of Commerce said, we have kids that lack, the, we have people who lack these skills. Kansas Chamber of Commerce, we can't hire people, they lack these skills. U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we have people who lack these skills. Kansas said, we need, we need kids with these skills. Academic, number one, and then these skills. I, for, for several years after, after this occurred, I took this chart, and I did it with you also a couple times, took this chart every time I spoke, every single time I spoke, and I asked an unfair question of the audience. I said to them, I want you to think about your own child that's still in school. Most of your children are gone. We have a few, uh, uh, most of your children are gone, but a few of you still have kids in school. Think of your own child. If not a grandchild, or grand, or if not, maybe a neighbor child down the street that, or someone at church that you really care about. Here's the unfair question I ask. If you had to pick only one of those skills that you wanted your child or your grandchild or your favorite kid in church to have when he or she becomes an adult, and it's unfair, Dina, because they're all great, what one skill would you choose? I ask audience after audience after audience that question. And over 9,000 Kansans. I didn't go to Oklahoma or Louisiana and ask the question. I asked it of Kansans. 9,000 Kansans, that's the wordle, which means the bigger the word, the more responses. Perseverance was by far the number one, followed by integrity, initiative, and self-regulation. You can see them all there, right? That's what Kansans said. If unfairly, Michelle, if I had to pick one, I'd pick that, but it's unfair because they're all good, right? So... Our researchers at the University of Kansas said, how does one gain perseverance? By the way, if you're an Alabama fan, you're in mourning, right? Because they've lost two football games now this year. Like, what's going on? Like, you know, if you're the University of Kansas or Kansas State, we think that's a good year. But in Alabama, that's not so, so good. And I was listening to a speech that, that Nick Saban was giving. I also was living, listening to a speech that... Uh, Pete Carroll, who's the coach of the Seahawks, was giving, talking about perseverance and that trait. So Dr. Gomer Erickson and Dr. Noonan are two researchers at the University of Kansas that help us with this work, said in order to get to perseverance, there's a set of, set of skills that you must be taught and you must learn. Self-regulation is the first one. Do I, can I manage my own behavior? I'm in charge of my own behavior and I can manage that. And you can see that self-regulation then leads to motivation, but motivation is a skill that you don't teach, but you teach other skills to get to. Self-efficacy, goal setting, initiative are taught. And those then lead to perseverance, which can also be taught. Guess what, we're on Wednesday, of buffer week. That means if you're not playing football because your team got beat, you are in no sports. Cross country's over. 
girls golf is over, tennis is over, boys soccer is over, volleyball, all the fall sports are done except football. Playoffs are still going on. And so on Wednesday, we're gearing up, we're gearing up in every school for a musical or a play. It's going to happen this Friday and Saturday. I asked superintendents last week, I, got, I was getting free tickets to, I was trying to find Oklahoma. There's, um, we found one school district doing Oklahoma, so, but all kinds of stuff. Guess what those drama teachers are teaching literally tonight after school when he or she's they're teaching these skills along with some kind of content. You better show up. That curtain goes up. You better be spot on that spot right there. You better not forget your line. You better be dressed. You better turn this way. And they're, they're dress rehearsing it, I bet, tonight and tomorrow night. And on Friday and Saturday, they're going to perform this thing. And the crowds are going to go wild in every single one of our school districts. We know this. From their research, we know that these skills in combination with academic skills are what lead to success. We know that. And so what I shared with you last week is so important. Too many of our kids are missing school. They're not showing up. Last year, 26%, and as I told you, as high as over 50%, in some school districts, miss more than 10% of the days of school. Not once in a while, like that's every week missing a day of school. It's too many. You can't learn something if you're not there. If the drama teacher tonight's having dress rehearsal and I don't show up, do you think he's very happy? I don't think so, because it's crunch time and we got to produce. Those that are playing football on Friday night, do they expect that their players are going to be at practice tonight after school? Same thing when you're trying to learn to read or you're coding. You, you have to practice. It's a repetition. You have to have repetition in self-regulation. You have to have repetition in academics. You have to have repetition. You can't do that if you're not there. This, this, we, have to, we have to reverse that. So I mentioned to you last time, what could, should we be doing? Lower those chronic absenteeism immediately. School boards can do that every month. Local boards, Dina and Salina, can say, tell me how many kids in Salina missed 10% of the days of school in October, and what are we doing about it? Does that make sense? And can we see a reduction in November? Are our <laughs> efforts making lower that number? That number should be driven to 5% or less. We'll never get to zero, but it's got to be down there low. You look at the districts being successful, they're driving that number low. we got to move kids out of level one. Mentioned that to you last month. We, how do you do that? We have to teach at the level of three and four. It's called, it's called uh, you know, the knowledge level, the depth of knowledge of three and four. But we've got to be tutoring kids out of level one. We've got to give them more reps. We've got to move them out of level one. Because if they're in level one, they have limited opportunities. We have to help students in those early grades develop self-regulation. I say this all the time to kindergarten teachers. I don't think I arrived at kindergarten fully formed for that experience. Mrs. Smith was an angel. Half-day kindergarten. I do remember I got to take a nap, eat some really good cookies, and drink some milk. But there are kids that arrive at kindergarten, and they're ready. Like, I want to play with my other kids in my class. I want to share. There are kids that run out in the street, like the teacher's chasing them. Self-regulation can be taught, but it has to be taught. That's that precursor to perseverance. Middle school, we talked about it. Some of the same things. Absenteeism. By the way, absenteeism gets worse the older you get. It gets worse. Move students, develop initiative and goal setting. If, the, if they're starting to show self-regulation, we start to build on it with the other skills, right? Setting goals. Do this gets you to this. Every great band squad in our schools set goals. We're going to go march on Friday night. It's going to look like this. We're going to go to contests. Every great the FBLA kids that we had here from Wellsville, you don't think they set the goal? We're going to nationals, and we're going to win that national. How about the debate squad that we honored? Do we need to remind everyone? 
There were three national championships in debate, high school debate. Kansas schools won all three last year. Not too bad. Cross country set goals, right? They accomplished a big one. You guys did this year. Raise the rigor and have higher expectations academically and behavior for kids. We have to. That doesn't mean we don't love them through it. It's not cruel. We just have to have higher expectations. High school looks very similar, but we have to do a more robust IPS. We need to be sitting down with every family and kids at least twice a year with having discussions around what's on Zello that says, Jim, I think you want to be a truck driver. And you go, I don't think I want to be a truck driver. Let's talk about why it, it gave you that. Let's talk about what classes you're interested in. Let's talk about what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. Let's plan a schedule for the next six months. Helping those students continue to develop perseverance. I've told you the story. I watched high achieving students in McPherson and we had a lot of them. A lot of those students, when they got to their junior, senior year, mostly junior, junior year, sometimes sophomore year, because these were advanced kids, hit pre-calculus. And I watched a lot of them for the first time in their life in the first nine weeks go from an A to a B or C in, that, in a class of kids that had never, ever had anything less than an A. And what do you think the general response was? A long line to the office, drop me out of this class, it's too hard. And then parents said, I don't know, I don't know what we're going to do. Betty, you know, my kid says it's really hard. And then we talked, what do you want to be? I want to be an engineer. I, I, I want to be, be a doctor. I want to be a, a chem, chemical engineer. Hmm. You're going to take calculus and a lot of it. And then, then the hard thing, I have to look at a parent Ann, and say, listen, we're going to love them through this, but they got to stay. They got to, they got to, they got to grit this. They got to get the perseverance. And hey, if they stayed, it all came out. They made it. But it, that initial shock was, I got to raise the game, right? I've never had to raise my game. It happens. And again, raise that rigor and that relevance. So. What actions should be, you be thinking about in the future? You put the standards here, put the cut scores here. You said, hey, how about we partner with the legislature and get some dyslexia work done? How about we put $16 million into training every teacher in our state in the science of reading and the science of mathematics so we know how to do that well? But we may have to be even more bold. Establish clear goals. You can help establish clear goals that local districts can take back every single month and start to measure locally against these metrics. For yourself, establish clear, measurable monthly and yearly goals to advance movement in student achievement, lowering chronic absenteeism, and, and how, do we, how do we help kids become better at perseverance so that high school graduation rates, and post-secondary success can go up. You have done remarkable work. You continue to hold the highest of standards as evidenced by other organizations in the United States. It's going to take your perseverance to see this through to help each child realize their potential to get to where they want to go. Mr. Chairman, I stand for any questions. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. And um, Randy, thank you for such an excellent presentation that keeps us grounded by data. The thing that I bring up often, and I still am very, very concerned, because when we look at where we're heading, things that we have done, educators appreciate that and value that. It's the other stakeholders that get to stand in judgment. Uh, Kansas schools are failing. We're all of the negative things. So my concern, and I ask this often, how do we develop a way 
so that legislator, community leaders, parents, those stakeholders, they get to evaluate the institution of education can appreciate those goals that we have accomplished. And I mention often that I feel like it's, it's a um, communication problem. Uh, if we're doing all of these great things, then what do we need to do to convey the success that we have achieved so far? That's part one. Can, part I, two. can I address that? Sure. If you wouldn't mind. Sure. So we just had an election last night. And in, many, uh, in Kansas and across the nation, many of those, not all, but many of those were very, very contested elections. Margins were slim. The governor's race, very slim, right? We are divided around this, around the message. We're divided. One side, schools are failing, schools are failing, we ought to do, do we ought to blow it up, do something. We're doing fine. Like, we're just, we're doing fine. Why don't you believe us we're doing fine? The truth is, we're not failing. We got to do better. Does that make sense? We got to, we got to head it on, Betty. We've got to be willing to say, it's not okay to have kids in level one. It's not okay to have kids that can't self-regulate. It's not okay that kids don't graduate high school. It's and, what are we, and we can do something about it. I think we, we get to our political sides and we want to tune each other out, say, look at the data. These are our kids and how do we get there? So now, and maybe we need a, a marketing budget that no one in state government has, so. Well, the thing that concerns me, and I hear this often about preaching to the choir. If you have 50% of the people that believe you're doing fine, and 50% that say, no, you're not, then efforts should be directed to those that uh, feel like you're not. And then what can we do? What information do they need? I'm not trying to suggest one side over the other. I do feel that it is our responsibility to try and get as many people on the same page as possible. So, I mean, and, and that's, that's going to be a lengthy conversation. I don't expect you to be able to, uh, to plot that out. I simply want you to understand that's, that's a real concern for me, what our message is saying and to whom. Um, the second part that, that part, oh, go ahead, may Andy. I, may sure. I? Okay. Sure. So let's, facts. Greatest number of kids graduating high school with students with disabilities in the history of our state. Greatest number of students in poverty graduating high school in the history of our state. Now, how do we even get the message out? Yeah. I, there's, no, there's no standard media that's shouted that out. Too many kids and a large number of kids academically in level one. I read about that. Both are true. We've got to move that number. We've got to have, do some things on the on the self-regulation, those Kansas can competencies, and academic, but there are some of our metrics are moving in the right direction. More students are graduating high school with a certificate, an associate degree, or baccalaureate, and most of that growth that you've done is in the skilled labor non-baccalaureate yeah. market, Betty. It's the plumbers and the electricians and the uh, EMTs. Most of that growth has been in the skilled labor market, which the Kansas Chamber says we desperately need more of. So yes, we need more teachers and engineers, but you're growing that. We have to be able to say the data is mixed and we've got to improve on the areas that we need to improve upon. And, and, I, and I appreciate and agree with everything that you're saying. I would love for us to take the time to maybe um, develop a way of finding out exactly. I mean, you have some people that are going to disagree just for the sake of disagreeing. And even if you show otherwise, they'll still disagree. That doesn't mean that we can't factor in and look at what can we do to in, at least increase your awareness that we are doing a great job. But let me move on to the second part real quickly. Again, I don't, um, I don't expect an answer, but when, we, when you identify those three areas, starting with chronic absenteeism, <coughs> and there are so many factors that lead to chronic absenteeism, things that it's not just about 
parents not sending their kids to school or, or kids deliberately missing school. You have factors such as health, that the, the, a child may be sick. You have, uh, even currently, factors such as transportation, buses not showing up, kids having no other way to school. Are we ever going to take a time where we maybe not put it in just one bucket, chronic absenteeism, but understand that there are some areas where perhaps we could impact that uh, with, I don't know, um, uh, options for those kids that are missing school because of their health or options if uh, uh, transportation can't get those kids. I mean, just where we are looking at it, where it's manageable. Uh, at some point, I would love for us to maybe drill down into each one of those categories and identify things that we can do right now that would impact that. And that's just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. And I would say yes on that. And I want to come back to this chart. Um, because yes on the academic too. Multiple reasons why a kid isn't performing, right? Could be a lot of reasons. Ben Proctor showed this chart just recently to a group of people, educators. So when the audience said, I don't believe that data, right? I don't believe that data. That, that's our data. I mean, that's Kansas kid data over two years. That's not made up. It's, but someone said, I don't, okay, well, if we get to the place where we can't believe the data, then we're going to have difficulty deciding what the solutions ought to be. But this, is, this isn't Texas kids. These are our kids that then went on to either graduate or not and went on to earn something or not. Mr. Chair. Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Um, I know one of the things you were going to talk about is parent engagement. Mm -hmm. And so when, I, when we talk about um, all those, all those uh, little media things that are going out, they're saying, we're failing kids, we're failing kids, scream. That comes out about every week, uh, maybe every Friday. Um, been hearing about that since 2010, um, just because there's certain people that want to portray that information out there and get that information to parents. So parents are confused, and I can see why they are, because I have, my son comes home and talks about his great teachers. They plan the whole year out. I know exactly, um, you know, I've got personal finance, and I know I've got this thing due on this, and I can see it too. It's on Canvas, so I can see he has, you know, 10 assignments. He's completed one of 10, because we have the whole semesters drawn out for him. Um, I can see when he has quizzes. I can see when he has unit tests. I can see when he has final exams. I can see all that. He's getting A's and B's, okay? Then it comes time for the assessment, and parents are saying, he did a state assessment, or he did a map test. Low. But he's getting A's and B's. And I can see his work. I can see that he's doing his quizzes. I can, he brings them home. He can show them to me. Um, I see that he's reading his books, because I'm asking him what the book's about. Um, so there's your confusion. The people are saying... We are, our NAEP scores are so low, and I'm thinking, well, what's the validity? Who's right or who's wrong? Because I can see my son's getting A's and B's, and he might score low on a map. Who knows if he was having a bad day on that map test? We don't know that. I don't see the assessments. I don't see those assessments. I do see his daily work. So the parents have to, if you're advocating for your kid, as I am for my kid, kids, and have for my one that's in college, if you're on top of those things, and he's doing his homework, so he's going to be self-regulated because he's getting them on time. If he's not, then he's maybe he needs a little, you know, boost or help. There's your perseverance is going to, you can't, coaches are like, we can't teach that. We can't coach that. Perseverance, kids has to just, that's something that drives them. Something has to drive them. But there's your, there's your concern, is the parents see something and they go, okay, he did really well in this map test. He did our assessment really well in this state assessment, but he's getting D's and F's. So <laughs> there, there's your problem. So we have to ask the parents and the public wh what's right and what's wrong. You have to decide as a parent, okay, let me, let me see here. Are we re can you read, me, read this to me or write a sentence, do syntax, do a sentence structure. Can you do that? Can you, do you know what a, you know, a pers personal pronoun? I mean, you have to start like, somebody has to, the teachers are trying to do that, but they're also trying to teach to an assessment that we can't see and we don't know what's on the assessment. We don't, I don't know what's on the assessment. Does the teacher know what's on the assessment? She knows exactly that the kids are acquiring knowledge in the classroom as far as uh, we're teaching personal finance, we're teaching biology. And, and you should see my oldest kid's notes. He takes 
they're in, a, they're in a bookshelf. He takes notes on chemistry. He takes notes on everything. He types up all of his, he writes his papers and types them up. He retains the information. I'm just, I'm not bragging on my kids, but I'm just saying, we've had some really good teachers over time, and, and my kids will come home and tell me that. They're awesome teachers. They're teaching me this, they're teaching me that. But then I failed the assessment. I failed the state assessment, or I didn't do well on the MAP score. So who, what's right or what's wrong? That's the communication we need to get out to the public. Yeah. Are those NAEP scores or assessments, what are they assessing? Because my kid's doing fine in his classroom with his teacher in that building. And that's what matters to me. Not what happened on that certain day where he took that state assessment or that MAP test or whatever it is. So when, we, when I see all that stuff and I see Kansas here, I'm looking at the, the building, I'm mm -hmm. looking at the teachers, I'm looking at the classes he's taken and how he's doing. I'm looking to see if he completed his assignments, how he did on his quizzes. Is it, he's getting, he might have failed a couple of quizzes, but boy, he got that unit test. He's finally getting it. Those are the kinds of things. Those are the things we have to talk about with, with the community. Jane Groff is going to be speaking to you really quickly. He's probably doing cartwheels back because you're talking about great parent engagement, Michelle. Uh, and you're right. That's why I always say you can't look at one, one thing and make global... Uh, you can't look at one test score and make total claims. You have to look at the, at the total picture, and you're evaluating what you just described. You're evaluating the total picture of your child's experience in school, and you're saying, overall, it's pretty darn good. We've got good teachers, and it seems to be pretty rigorous, and my kid seems to do fairly well, and we're, we're meshing those two, and they, they have some extracurricular activities that, that seem to parlay that. Other people will look at that and say, don't have kids in school, so they can't measure that, and they're looking at the test scores and saying, but these aren't any good, therefore I'm going to make an assumption that everything's bad. I, I think we just have to have a conversation with people that is the value of a child is never on any one test or one experience. It's the culmination of, of how you look at it, and I think you've articulated that very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Randy, I appreciate that going back over some of these things. As you know, I've been spending a lot of time trying to get ready for the legislature because I think we're going to really have a struggle over there. Um, I guess the good news is they already handed us their playbook, literally. I was in there. Jim was in there in the playbook. But I kind of consider getting in that book like when the Phelpses show up for your concert, you know, you're doing something really right. But we've got, I think, you know, we hear a lot of junk about like how Florida is so awesome, you know, and it had to do with school choice, which we know is total bunkum because when you look at the number of kids in private schools in Florida compared to the total public schools, you know, that had nothing to do with, with uh, academic improvement. Maybe what had to do with academic improvement is Florida's constitutional amendment that set a class size limit that we would all be very envious of about 20 years ago. So I think um, everybody's right. We've got to do, get our story together to rebut some of this junk we're going to see. Um, even like the thing about um, how, well, they got money every year, but academic scores didn't go up. Well, it's like, you know, if you're starving, and you're on a 1,200-calorie diet, and they raise it to 1,300 calories, you're still starving. You know, you're not going to get better on a starvation diet. So I think we've got some really good stories to tell. We've got some good plans in place. I think um, on the structured literacy, though, obviously, uh, but we're only two years into it, so I'm not sure what to expect yet at this point. Um, I would expect every district to have a structured literacy curriculum in place, and I'm not sure that's happening. And I think it ought to be something we account for in accreditation. If they're not there yet, they don't get fully accredited. It's just we know literacy is too important. But I don't know. Do you have a feel for? Well, no, I think there's, there's some things coming you're going to have to be pretty bold on. Yeah. I just think you are because the evidence is becoming very clear, right? I mean, the more information we get, there's things that are, I think are just going to compel you to probably take some action. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we'll be talking about graduation tomorrow, uh, but I think that's one area that you're going to have to look at. What, what is, are you picking on those tens of dozens yeah. of, of curriculum that is research, scientific, of reading and mathematics, 
uh, and how are you looking at that? So I, th I think there's some, there's going to be some decisions that this board's going to have to make in the next several months. Yeah, and maybe maybe this is a future agenda item, but um, explain to the board what NAEP is about because I doubt if most people understand it's really only a few hundred kids statewide who take it. It's not like every kid takes it. It's a minimal sample amount. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're going to have one more question from Dina, then we're going to move on, but Jane still gets her full time. <laughs> Within Thank reason, you. Jane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When you started talking about chronic absenteeism, that um, was a key to me to um, share with, with you that I was in Salinas, at Salinas board meeting last night. And that was one of the big focuses, was the chronic absenteeism. And it is different at each level. When, I get, when they get to high school, it's 42% plus. And they have figured out that if students start in kindergarten missing one to two days a month, and parents are kind of like, so what? It's just one or two days. But if you add that up, by the time they're a senior in high school, they have missed a whole year of instruction. And that's pretty incredible. So thank you for bringing that up because my intent is to ask that <clears throat> we study more in depth that particular issue and know what the department is doing to assist districts that have that issue and how much um, information the department asks from, um, from each district regarding that so they can also see that there's an issue in that district if the district is kind of overlooking it. And it just seems to me that that's one of the key issues that our students are, who cannot read, who cannot do math, are probably missing. So thank you for keying us in on that issue. I think it's really important for us to look at the multiple reasons for chronic absenteeism. For instance, I was already a superintendent by the time my children were born. And they went to school every day because they had those parents that just made sure they went to school every day. And my, my children had the same attitude. Three of my four children, grandchildren would have been listed in the last month on a chronic absentee list because of health reasons. There are multiple reasons to do that. We need to look at those reasons and those things that we can control and those things that we can't. That meeting that Ann was referring to, uh, I said something about COVID during that meeting and, one of the, and the chairman of the committee said, well, I'm tired of hearing about COVID. Well, I am too, but two of my grandchildren were chronic absentee in October because of, because of COVID. We can be tired of hearing about it, but it's still having an impact. And we need to make sure that that's, that we that we control for that, but also we look at those other reasons. There are things that we can control and things that we cannot, uh, but we don't need to just discount issues just because it's convenient. Thank you, Randy, for that. I now declare the open citizens open forum at 10:54. The state board provides the opportunity for citizens to share views about topics of interest, issues currently being considered by the State Board. The State Board asks 
The speakers identify themselves, identify themselves. They focus their remarks on topics. Personnel attacks will not be tolerated. Each speaker shall be limited to three minutes. Any board classifications will be for clarification. Our first speaker is Susan Hallstrom, and our second speaker is Michelle Olson. So we'll start with Susan. Welcome to the State Board of Education. Thank you. Can you hear me? I understand that you're going to go 10 minutes over time. 10 so seconds. I'll, 10 seconds over time. Thank you. Yeah, I, so, I, I, this is my three minute and 10 second so version. So Mark will start five seconds uh, late so, <laughs> so I don't have to throw my gavel at you. Okay, thank you. Are we ready? Yes. I'm Susan Hallstrom. I'm a teacher at Shawnee Mission East High School. I am a relentless advocate for my students. I have served on the KSDE Teacher Vacancy and Supply Committee. We were tasked with exploring the problem of attracting teachers to and retaining those teachers in the profession. Currently, I'm serving on the KSDE Substitute Shortage Working Group. The name of the group clearly defines our goals to provide solutions to the crippling substitute shortage in the state. People are not choosing teaching as a profession. Why? People are not flocking to the teaching profession to work as substitutes. Why? Why is the question we failed to address? Why is the teaching profession failing to attract teachers, retain teachers, and maintain a pool of skilled substitutes? Why is the profession, full-time or as a substitute, an unattractive option? We can spend much time talking about valuing and honoring the profession. We can work diligently to find alternative pathways for teacher licensure. We can make the criteria for working as a substitute teacher unbelievably low. We can do those things and have zero impact on the real problem. In fact, we are making the problem worse by taking some of those actions. I've repeatedly brought up the real problem, the failure of the state of Kansas to adequately compensate and value teachers, and that includes substitute teachers. I've listened to many of those in leadership positions redirecting and dismissing my concerns with statements like, let's focus on what we can impact. We can't control the money, so let's focus on something else. Teachers are in it for the outcome, not the income. In a profession that's about 70% women in the state of Kansas, we as a straight state teach teaching as a second income profession. This is dishonorable and has to stop. From the Economic Policy Institute, August 16, 2022 article, the teacher pay penalty has hit a new high. U.S. compensation care comparison to non-teaching four-year degree graduates. In 1979, teacher salaries were about 22.9% less. In 96 to 2002, teacher salaries were about 25.5% less. In 2021, teacher salaries were staggering 32.9% less. We have an obligation to the children in our care to support a system that attracts and retains teachers of high quality. That includes substitute teachers. Due to that, we must stop avoiding the difficult conversation about what needs to be done to compensate teachers at a level that will both attract and retain quality people. In addition to equitable and realistic competition, compensation, teachers face other serious issues that I haven't time to mention. With the job market demanding workers in every walk of life, teachers can find better jobs with better compensa compensation. I have listened and watched as the standard for teachers, and especially for substitute teachers, are diminished. We are playing academic limbo with teacher standards. How low can we go? This is a dangerous game. Lowering the standards for substitute teachers by allowing high school graduates with no post-secondary experience to work with our children is a failure of the system. By allowing this to happen, we exacerbate the problem. Lowering standards is damage control and co contributes to the problem, period. Band-aid fixes to a broken system are not an appropriate course of action. I am a relentless advocate for my students. Thank you. And you made it. <laughs> Did I make it? And uh, I want to thank you for your service on those okay, committees. Does thank you. Want these? Give them to. This is my four-minute version. I've got a few. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to go low. Oh, that was my last one. Michelle. Welcome to the State Board of Education. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Um, so last month I was here and I summarized in three minutes. I'm pretty sure I wasn't a second over for you. That's why I was talking so fast. Um, the logical and ethical reasons why we need to include consent education into our standards. So today I'm here to listen to your response. This is the, 
The open forum is for you to talk to us. Okay. Um, I haven't heard from you, so I didn't know if I emailed everyone. So I guess I'm assuming that means you're not interested. But um, I have here, I, last month I reviewed um, the, what our standards say today in the Kansas Health Education Standards. And right now it says the students will know, comprehend, an apply, analyze, synthesize, and or evaluate laws associated with sexual behaviors. And it says consent, harassment, assault, rape, etc. And I pointed out that in Kansas penal law, consent is not defined. So teachers, I mean, very understandably, and it's probably best practice to not teach that because there is no definition. So, so it goes back to the dangerous rhetoric of consent means no means no, and maybe yes means yes, and a minimum age requirement. And that's just not the case, as I explained last month, um, why that is dangerous and why someone might assume or believe they have consent when they don't because no means no, and so does a lot of other things. And yes doesn't mean yes, because you can say yes under force, fear, or fraud. So. I don't think in any way you mean to assume that we don't, that we're diminishing this. I know as a parent of daughters and granddaughters, I have significant concerns with this issue. And in my home, we discuss it regularly uh, as part of the process. So don't make any assumptions. There's a lot on our plate. Now, that's not an excuse. But that's okay. a fact. There's a lot on our plate. This is an important issue and okay. needs to be addressed. That's it? That's it for today. Okay. Thank you. State Board of Education Open Forum is closed at 2.01. I'd like to thank our speakers. The State Board will determine if any of these should be addressed as future agenda items. Parent Engagement in Schools. James Groff is the Parent Information Resource Center. And Britton Hart from the uh, Kansas Association of School Boards are going to be visiting with us at this point. Jane, it's all yours. Thank you um, for the invitation. First of all, um, we always consider it a great honor uh, to be here and let alone to be invited to be here. So thanks so much. My name is Jane Groff. I'm the executive director of the Kansas Parent Information Resource Center. That is a KSDE technical assistance systems network project, TASN project. So um, we thank you every year when we begin our new year because of the funding that you've provided. And this is my good friend. I'm Tamara Huff and I am a project coordinator for the Kansas Parent Information Resource Center. Glad to be here this morning or afternoon now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, we pull this out to get it to move. There we go. Okay, so um, we have real three short purposes today. Um, to be here really um, and one of them is just kind of to talk about what KPERC, how we're working, what's our focus, where we're working in the state because we follow your lead, we follow your outcomes, we follow what KSDE data is saying and, and we go there and we address those issues with the idea of parents in mind. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, some data that we've collected that we think you would really like to see because it's hard to get data back from families. To collect family engagement data is really a rarity for a state. And Kansas leads the way. Uh, I go to national meetings all the time, and you're going to hear why we, we lead the way in collecting parent data. But it is hard to collect, and Kansas does it. 
um, like no other state. And then we heard that you would like to have some talk about um, some parent-teacher conference ideas, especially at the high school secondary level. So we're going to do that, and that is when Britton's going to come up and kind of tell his story, because nothing is uh, better than hearing it from um, someone who's been out there and done it. But I wanted to begin here that KPERC really focuses when we are invited to school districts or school buildings on the culture that school building or district has about engaging families. And many times if we talk to them about family engagement, they'll say they'll go right to events. So they will say we have a literacy night and we have a, um, a back to school night and certain events. And those will always be, they will always be, and they can develop great community if done well, if done well. But when Tammy and I are out doing professional development, providing technical assistance, we are focused on a lot more than those events. We are focused on the beliefs, the attitudes, the norms, the values, the actions and assumptions of the school organization explicitly that they embrace and are committed to the notion of families as a foundational core component to improvement and greater student learning and performance. So family engagement is much deeper and wider than we tend to think, much deeper. So we really focus on those things. And when those things are dealt with at, at, by great leaders and great educators, then you've got this culture. You've got a culture that welcomes family, engages families, and, say, and says, we want you to support your child's learning. So the culture is reflected in the actions of those in the organization. What are, what are the leadership? What are the educators? How do they approach families? Do they see them as strengths-based? or with a deficit lens, with a deficit lens. And then the artifacts, when I go into a school, I'll walk around, I'll look at the walls, I'll say, where do families find themselves? Where do they see themselves in the mission, in the vision, in some great photos of student learning? Um, and in the organizational practices, how are the practices set up? So I'm going to share that way back in 2016, and don't worry about reading the font. I just want you to look at the green lines, OK? Um, but way back in 2016, we developed um, really the first statewide parent engagement survey. And um, there was a high school that we provided a lot of technical assistance to on how to administer this survey, get data back from their families, and it was really unique because it was a high school and, and it had great leadership, a superintendent and a principal that said, um, we want to do this, Jane, come uh, provide TA. So I just loved going there because the leaders were um, just awesome. So in 2008, you endorsed the PTA National Family School Partnership Standards in 2008. So it made sense that this statewide survey is based on those standards, all right? We weren't just going to pull it out of anywhere. We were going to, again, align ourselves with you. That first standard is a welcoming environment. But it isn't just, um, oh, do I feel welcome as a parent? And that's important. That's very important. But I like the second part of it that says the school work to build positive relationships with my family. So you can see there's some statements there. One is, in this school, staff, administrators, teachers, counselors build positive relationships with families. And another is, when I walk into the school, I feel welcome. So since 2016, uh, we call this version one survey. In total, we've had 44,000 parents take this survey across Kansas. But you can say in this partic you can see in this particular school district, this high school, the bottom line you can see is where they started out. Okay? So they got the survey out to families. The middle line was the next year, like that was 2018. It started in 17, they did it in 18 and it dropped. And they said, Jane, we don't know what that's about. We think it's because more families took it 
that year, many more families, and that would have an impact to make it maybe a little more realistic for that drop, but then you can see 2019, that dark green, they shot up and they shot way ahead. And they were so encouraged. And I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but I do want you to look at standard two is communication. All right, same pattern, set 2017, you can see the score, 18 is drop and then 19 shoots ahead again. Third standard is supporting student learning. Uh, Michelle talked about that a lot, how families are engaged in supporting their students, uh, their child's learning. Same pattern, 2019, just really, um, this district was so thrilled. And then standard four and five are sharing power and advocacy. Do parents feel like they share power over the decisions about their student learning? And are they allowed to advocate, you know, to speak up and are they listened to, et cetera, et cetera? And did they feel that way? Did they feel that way? And the last standard is community involvement. Same pattern from 17 to 18 and 19. And the reason I wanted you to see this off of version one of this survey back in 2016 is because this particular high school said, Jane, we think we know why this happened. We really believe we know. And we said, okay, why is that? And they said, because of student-led parent-teacher conferences, we provided training to have the high school students lead their own conferences. And we said, uh, combine that individual plan of study in there, make them, um, that's their story to tell, their goal, their courses, where they're headed. And then the other thing that they said um, they believed that made this huge difference was that they assigned one adult in the high school to every student uh, to have contact with, and I can't remember if it was once a week or twice a month, but somebody was knew every kid and they had that interaction. So I just wanted you, first of all, to know that in 2016, that is when this survey rolled out, and we've been hearing from family members up to 44,000, maybe more now. And this was version one, but now we have a version two, and I want Tammy to tell you about that. Okay, so with the latest version, we did additional studies, and so we had um, a focus group where we had nine principals, superintendents, and MTSS coaches from uh, Kansas school districts. The purpose was to determine what we needed to put in the version two so that we can make sure that we are collecting information on the benefits. We disseminated the survey through email, through social media, through text messages, went out to parents all across the state. Um, and we made some special considerations, you know, making sure that our families knew why the survey was important, which then led uh, more parents to take the survey. The other thing that was very important was that we wanted to communicate any changes that were made in response to the survey information that we received back. So the way that our district administrators are using the information that they've received, they're able to then talk with their site councils look over the data with them and analyze it and find out exactly where their strong um, areas are and then those areas that need improvement. They were able to share the information with school board members and then use it when they were setting their KISA goals. That information was also shared on district websites. Um, and the key message is the data doesn't lie. And so when we were talking about, you know, sometimes we have people that say, yes, it's true, others that say, no, it's not. Um, the numbers are the numbers. And those numbers give the guidance on what areas the district may need to focus on. So it's important to share those um, intentions with families. We collected it, and so we want to make sure that they know, here's what was said, here's what we're going to do with it. So we had some quotes that came directly from the um, focus group and the surveys. And I don't want to read all of them to you, but I like the one that says the data was spot on with what we see. It was no surprise. And then every interaction, whether we like it or not, matters. And that goes back to that whole idea of building relationships with our families. Some reminders is that we can make sure that our data is displayed by the district or the building. 
And then we can also display it by subgroup category. Now what I mean by that is in version two, we do collect some demographic information. And so we're able to then select, um, you know, what is it that our Hispanic families are feeling? What do the black parents say? What do um, families that have students with an IEP or 504 plan, what are their thoughts? How are we engaging them? And so we can break down by um, those categories of special education services, race or ethnicity, and even free and reduced lunches as well as our English learners. So we can do that um, in display, a combination of a district, a building, by subgroup. You can pretty much look at the data from any way that you want to. And so with that, our overall message is that the participants in the focus group, they feel like the data is representative of their current realities. So members of the district leadership teams feel like this survey data is very valuable. So we're using it to create action plans with schools. Um, we're directly tying it to any engagement practices that our family engagement um, liaisons are using within each school district. And so it provides that data so that they can um, target their message a lot better. Um, we were recently with a school district that had given the survey, the new survey, updated version two with demographics. And uh, this principal said it was really great because they could clearly identify that the families that said, we, we get positive reports on our children. They can, you can break that down in, demogra in demographics and figure that out. And what they saw was that the families of low income, families of low SES, socioeconomic status, said, we don't hear the positives. We're not getting the positives. So then that makes for a clear goal for that school, for the educators, for the teachers to come together on and say, all right, we, we hear it, we see it, and what do we do about it? So um, um, the demographic piece is so important, and we work long and hard on um, getting that set up, not just us, but the University of Kansas, the evaluation team, is who we work with to do that. So I wanted you to see, in a nutshell, um, the KPERC scope of work and family engagement. It isn't like, you can see family engagement is the center, but it is involved in that K readiness measurement, the ASQ measurement. How is that explained to families? You just don't give it and keep it within, but how is that, how do families know how to give that and how do they get the results? Social emotional learning, we're constantly encouraging um, schools to talk about it. You are doing so many good things in social emotional learning, but the families don't know about it unless you send it home, talk about it, um, and are excited about it. Your ind I, individual plans of study, in my opinion, my humble opinion, at secondary level, that is where family engagement should be at. And we need to develop that out more and more. I know it takes time, but we need to make that IPS, that student story, so that the parents can sit down with them and they know that goal that that student had. And they can say, all right, so what classes do you take next year to keep moving on toward that goal? And so that it's a comfortable conversation um, and that you know, families just feel like at a time when family engagement can, it changes, it changes at middle school and high school, but we don't say back out and back off. We're, we say, we got a new, new way, come in, we're going to make you part of this IPS and still stay engaged in your child's learning. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, by just by including demographics on our survey that wasn't there before, that is a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion act so we can hear from all families. That's what it means to hear from everybody and that simple act of demographics um, sets that up better. Attendance, Tammy and I have never been busier in the uh, area of chronic absenteeism and attendance. And, um, but our approach is a little different because schools are working hard on identifying the students, uh, what is our percentage, which students are chronically absent, what is the risk, setting up systems within schools to do something about it. 
So our approach is, all right, what are we doing as districts and schools to inform families? Many do not even know what chronic absenteeism is. Not because they can't understand it, but because it isn't a term that's been used. So as we are invited out, we've developed a professional development for educators to do with families on chronic absenteeism and attendance. And it's fun, first of all, fun for the families. And they come away knowing that two days a month means 10% of the school year and my child's chronically absent. So such things have been developed for refrigerators for them to put in the refrigerator to say and mark when their child doesn't go to school. So they can look up and go, oh, we have missed four days this month. I remember, uh, you know, that's too many. So our work is for families because we want them engaged in this. Um, we want them engaged and then, and then doing what they can do about it. So that's been our approach. And then professional prep. Tammy recently has become, uh, I say, certified, <laughs> uh, trained um, to go into teacher preparation programs and um, look at how are they asked to engage families? Are they? What prep do they get in working with families? Because the research shows that if we do not get that prep, in teacher education. We're going to graduate, and the tendency is to see families as adversaries rather than your greatest allies. Um, so, and then um, we were asked to talk a little bit, um, just kind of Britain. He, I hope he's warming up back there. Because um, years ago, Emporia High School invited us out to do some work with their staff in this area of um, parent-teacher conferences. And so uh, through the leadership there who was really, I mean, I mean, you have to have a leader that's enthused and says, we want support, we want help, we want new ideas. So we went out and we did professional development for the entire school staff on student-led parent-teacher conferences. Showed them videos of middle school, high school students, what that looks like when they lead their conference and their parents are there, what that looked like. And then we incorporated the individual plan of study in it um, to, as, as a strategy for engaging families. But I must say that leadership, as always, nothing new to you all, was key. We were invited out by leadership, and leadership um, kept this movement strong. So Britton is going to share about his experience there, um, how it increased the number of parents. I've had um, parents say, that their parent um, conferences were like 20%, 30% of parents that would show up. And after they started student-led conferences, and especially student-led, they would have 80% of families, just that quick. Because in order for parents to show up, the research says, what we're inviting them to must be relevant. It must be relevant to them. So um, what's more relevant than their children, their children doing well in education and in school? So Britton, would you like to tell, tell us more? Tell us more. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah, we have a couple of questions, but we'll, oh. wait. we'll, we'll, we'll wait. Go ahead, Britton. Uh, and then after it's over, you guys hang around because there's some questions. We will. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon. And uh, Jane and her staff and what they do is outstanding. And, Obviously, a great resource to our, our districts, but um, I'm not sure exactly. Just there we go. And now, just. Eric, we have a new PowerPoint. Sorry, Eric. Had to make it difficult. But anyway, as he gets started, though, um, I want you to kind of think about this. I'm going to talk really about how do you develop the culture in the system? 
She talked about the research. She talked about the importance. I think we all know the importance of parent engagement, but I think it's just as important as leaders and teachers and schools. We got to develop a system and we got to develop a culture that parents feel comfortable coming in. I mean, it's one thing to talk about, it's another to make sure it's actually the reality. And so, uh, my predecessor actually is Dathan Fisher. He couldn't be here this afternoon, but thought it would be uh, nice to include him in this process because he's carrying out the work uh, now that I am not. But uh, as we got started, um, really wanted you to think about how do we build positive relationships with parents. Uh, there's a reason that parents become less engaged as they get older in the system. And, and I think it's simple. I think it's really in the case that, first of all, when you go home and your kids are like, hey, you want mom and dad to come to parent teacher conference? Uh, no. You know, I really don't. They don't talk about school as much. There's not as much of engagement. And to be honest, if you're a parent and you're going to a high school conference, what do you know about calculus and physics? And so how am I going to make an impact when my kids come home? Am I going to help them with that homework? And so gradually we have this system that really just encourages and fosters an environment where parents are less involved. And so we had a problem and we had to start thinking about how we were going to address it. And so really we started to think about the why. And it's really less about us just increasing our numbers at, at parent-teacher conference. That's one of the outcomes. It's more important that parents feel comfortable, engaged with the school, and engaged with thinking about what is important for their student. Again, they're going to struggle just like I do. Uh, my, my wife's a teacher. We're going to probably ask some pretty good questions of my kids, but at the end of the day, we don't know what's exactly happening in the classroom unless we have that conduit. And so, but what I can do is we can talk about what their skills and interests are, and we can ask about what they want to do after high school. Again, I'm going to send them to tutoring. They're probably going to go over to Dr. Watson's house to get a little calc work, but I can talk about the skills and interest, and we can talk about what they want to do after high school. So we have a junior in college. It's going to graduate this year in PT. And so I know a little bit about physical therapy, all of us at this table to do a little bit. I have a junior in high school that has special needs. I know a little bit about that, but not enough to help her. And then we have a third grader. Yeah, that's right. We have a little bit of a span there. And so as we get through the system, our parents feel the exact same way. And so how do we engage them in a better way? And high school is notorious, notorious for dropping them off. As we talk about each student, it is important that we engage each parent. Uh, because each one of those parents have that value for their student. As we think about the vision that you started with your meeting today, we had to start to think a little bit differently about what we wanted to do and how we wanted to approach that. And so as we think about the change, there's a couple things that really resonated with me and resonated with our staff, most importantly, because they're the ones that did the work and our kids. And the first thing is the traditional parent-teacher conferences were just not working. We would average about 30 to 25 percent, give or take, between the fall and the spring of attendance. And you're sitting there and it's, it's kind of like an empty room. There is nobody there. And we're like, what are we doing? We're spending countless hours, countless amount of resources and nobody's really coming in the door. And so it feels like we're wasting our staff's time as well and our students. The parent engagement, extremely low. <clears throat> as we surveyed our, our parents, there really wasn't anything for them to come to. If they had a high flying student, those typically were ones, uh, uh, Miss Michelle here, she talked about how wonderful her kids were and the experiences. She's probably walking through that door. It's nice as a parent to hear from your teachers how your kids are doing, right? But if you're a student or a parent that maybe your kids are struggling, <clears throat> you don't want to go and hear that again and again and again. And so how do we change the narrative a little bit? And so that engagement was really important for us to think about. The student-centered focus, why are we doing all the talking as adults? Why can't we let the student articulate what he or she might want to do when they get out of high school? What are you interested in? Oh, mom, dad, I didn't know that. And so that was important. And the career and academic in the college planning, we notoriously have always prepared kids in our school for college. So we've changed that narrative. This is called career and academic planning for a reason, not college planning. College may be a part of that, but obviously we want to start thinking about those skills and interests and what career would I connect with? Maybe we said truck driver earlier. So what are the academic skills? What are the courses? What are the things that you're going to need to do to be prepared to be able to do that? So we need to set that up. And we're, we want to make sure we set goals. We talked earlier. Our boards need goals. Our schools need goals. So do our kids. Our kids need to figure out what they're interested in, where they want to go, and how to get there. And the most important thing in this process for us, we had about 100 teachers 
about 1,200 conferences to schedule, we're gonna have to have all our staff on board. I can't do that, our admin team can't do that. Uh, it was really critical to have our staff buy into this, and they did. Um, and then the last piece on the change was our language uh, barrier, language support. Uh, a lot of times we had a high migrant population, they would walk in, it's pretty intimidating to walk into a room, not know anybody, not speak the same language, and then just to think, go, hey, go find your teacher, go navigate the system, and hopefully, uh, if you brought your kid, they could uh, interpret for you. And so that was a barrier we had to come over and, and, and make sure we addressed. So to do that, though, we have to build a system, folks. It's like anything, some of you have been in education yourselves, we have to have a structure that is clear, roadmap, if you will. How are we going to get there? And so we built this uh, in conjunction. Everybody in the building has a role, and it starts with this advisor model. Uh, we built some CAP classes. Each one of you would be placed in a CAP class. You would loop with that individual uh, over the four years. I would get so connected to Mr. Porter as my teacher. He knows everything about me, my parents, what's going on in my life. And there's about 12 to 15 kids that he would really have to own and make a meaningful relationship. And so every student in that building, everyone had a champion. Not everybody can say that, folks. Not every school can say that. And that is the that to me is the cornerstone that Jane talked about of having that positive relationship. And so that started with that relationship. And the teachers, we, we went through, we also talked about the individual plan of study, the skills and interests. That should drive what a student does in, the, in our building. That should be connected with the parents. The parents must and can and will be involved. That's something they're comfortable with. And the last piece you'll see right there in the middle is this community involvement. As we got better at this, it's one thing to have high parent engagement. It's another to connect it to the IPS. And that last piece is how do we get kids that real world experience out in our community? So they want to do that career, but they want to most importantly come back and live in our community and, and thrive. So as we set this up, our teachers needed support. They need to design opportunities through the eyes of the student. They need to design conversations that parents could listen to but the most important thing it started with the relationships it's that personalized learning we had specific things around your skills and interests that were built into uh, what we called uh, Spartan success four times a week so Monday through Thursday you had a seminar class if you will that was specifically designed for you each individually I could give each one of you the same thing right here you could figure out what are your skills and interest Obviously, we know we, you like kids, you like being on the state board, but is it more than that? And so that's what our kids had to do. They, started, they had to start to reflect and think about that. You don't always get that in Algebra 2, do you? But you have to start thinking about what, what am I good at? What are some things that I might be good at that I need to start working toward? And what is that goal that I want to have after high school? Every single kid has that, and every single parent wants that for their kid. Uh, along with that, though, you have to have that solid academic foundation. We have to monitor that progress. We have to keep a positive perspective. We have to connect. If Mr. Porter's my, my CAP teacher, I need to connect with Mark to say, you know what? What are we teaching in English, let's say, that connects with this young person's skills and interests? There's got to be a concerted effort. It is going to be personalized through the IPS. The goals are important all to get to that post-secondary readiness. So I won't bore you with this. You guys are experts in the IPS. Uh, you're very familiar with that. But that drove everything that we did. This is the system that we're creating so that we can have the conferences. A couple examples of how this looks. And so the format's important. The structure's important. I won't bore you with all the details, but it is important to map this out. What do we want kids to know? What do we want them to explore? What do we want them to be able to have when they leave our system? These are things parents know. These are things parents can be engaged with. But you got to build a system around it. And structure that all the way from August to May and structure that all the way from ninth grade to 12th grade when they leave your system. And so we connected at that point. It was career cruising. They're using Zello now. But the thing that really should drive what our school does is not what our teachers want to teach. It's not what we think is a building. It should be what the skills and the interests are of every single one of those kids. That should drive our schedule. That should drive our system. That should drive what we offer. And so we did it strictly through this lens. What is your skills and interest? How does that impact your career planning and your goals? And do we have the right courses to align with that? Janet, if you wanted to be a, a beautician, 
to your beautiful woman, do we have that opportunity in the high school setting for you to try some of those things out? And if we didn't, and we had a large enough people, large enough group of people, are we going to start to develop programs that would align with that? That's how we did business. And not, not because, well, it's a great goal, Janet, but doggone it, we just don't have those classes. We don't have those opportunities for you. So as we got better at that, that was our mechanism. And letting parents talk with their kids about that at the, at the uh, parent-teacher conference was really important. So again, we were very specific about career and academic planning and how they could be involved with that. Parent engagement went way up. It was student-led. The relationships, each one of you as a parent could, could go in there and you could eyeball that one Spartan success teacher that you knew. And automatically you had an adult that was familiar to you. The scariness, the anxiety of that went way down, right? If you need an interpreter, we already had that for you. You didn't have to ask. You didn't have to come to the front table and go, you know what, I need support here. No, we had one ready as soon as you walked in. They were going to be ready for your conference. And the relationship with the parent was just as important as the student. And so we were very specific on how we did this, because you're trying to think whether you're in a large system or small system. I know, is Wichita East? North. North. Ooh, that's fighting words, isn't it? Sorry about that. <laughs> but when you're scheduling a lot of kids, we need to, again, we need to have a system to be able to do that. So we did that through the CAP teacher. Mr. Porter only had to schedule 12 conferences. That's not too bad, right? But if I just said, hey, anybody just come in whenever they wanted, we're going to get that 30% like we always have. And so we made that personal connection. Many times what worked the best is I would have the kids call during the CAP class, their parent right there. We would have this schedule up on the, the wall, and you'd start to fill it out. The opens are very simple because we had teachers that taught the Algebra two and the Physics and they still wanted to see their kids, right? They still wanted to see the kids that were taking their classes. And so you would schedule a 10 to 12 to 15 minute CAP conference, and then you could go and see those teachers that you wanted to see. Go connect with your kids as a teacher that maybe, you know what, I want to go talk to the English language arts teacher. I have a question about spe something specific. But we did that through a lens. We scheduled all 1,200, worked slick, and it was also convenient. We also connected if, if you three were brother and sisters, well, guess what? Your parent doesn't want to come three separate times, right? So they had priority on when they got to come. And so then we went, you got to pick your slot first. And so it made it more convenient. We had clear talking points with parents, and we had clear talking points that the teacher and the kid could help illustrate uh, and understand for their kids. Their parents could see what was going on. They could see what their kids' skills and interests were. And the, kid, and the parents that didn't come, it was important that we followed up with them one-on-one. -on -one. And it, it was again, it was through the CAP teacher so that we could make that relationship. As we go through this plan, it was important that they could see where we started and where we we're going to end. I have just, I'll show you just a little snippet here, just because it's kind of neat to see, see it in action. Maybe. Maybe not. Was it Ben over there? You got me in lockdown, don't you? No? Anyway, I think it, I've, I've shared the slide bank. You can watch it too. But it's important that we not just showed our parents, but we showed our staff how this would work and model and have them get a comfort level with how this should work. The last piece that maybe you want to hear and then I'll be done is uh, this all drove what we did to get higher graduation, higher success rate, higher effect rate. 91% is the highest that Emporia High has been probably in their history. Um, is, that, is that the end all be all? No. But that was one factor that, that certainly drove our work. We went from 35% in the fall to 81. Um, pretty significant gain. We still had about 19% of our parents though that we had, we struggled to get in and we struggled to connect with. House, home visits, um, personal connections with some of our support staff at the district office helped close that gap a little bit, but that's still pretty difficult. The spring, though, I don't know how many of you have spring, spring students. Uh, a lot of times, uh, about ready to graduate, check out. It was still difficult to get people, but we had a higher level of success by just developing that system and that culture that we felt were important to make sure the parents felt comfortable. So thank you, and Mr. Chair, if you have any questions, otherwise... Appreciate the time and the opportunity to share.
If I remember correctly, Betty has, Betty has the first question, but if I remember, I need to be check on conflict of interest. I believe that you have an acquaintance with one of the presenters. I do, and I'm going to spare her questions. Okay. okay. <laughs> I actually will start with, with, with you, if I could, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Because you put a slide up there about why change, and let me, let me tell you, I feel like my role is here's the ideal, here's the reality. How do we bridge that gap? My concern, which brought this about, was as a parent, there's this option called parent view. I get to communicate daily, weekly, monthly with each teacher to find out what assignments are miss missing, how she doing in class. And I, uh, let, me, let me clarify this because many times people will look at, at uh, my daughter and think I'm referring to her. I have, I have a 16 year old and it is Betty, not Sarah. But <laughs> I have a 16 year old. Now, when I communicate with the teachers and I'm finding out what's missing, what she has to do, uh, what her grade is. I'm getting this information in real time. So parent-teacher conferences don't mean as much to me today as they did mm -hmm. when I was parenting Tammy. Yeah. Because I didn't have all of those features. So when we talk about the significant drop in parent participation. Uh, they're not showing up. I have asked the question, when do we factor this in? When do we take a look that a parent can decide, I know what's going on in real time. I don't need to go there. Now you did put up some, some slides and honestly, when you set up a 10 minute slot and your slides show that, 10 minutes, this teacher, 10 minutes, this teacher. There's no way we're gonna go over all of those wonderful, great things in that 10 minute span of time. And I have I've been to the conference, I'm, I'm sitting there and I see this line of parents and I'm wondering if they're gonna remember me in the parking lot because I overstayed my 10 minutes. Those are real issues. We don't cover everything that really can be covered in that 10 minute span of time. But on parent view, if I have an hour's worth of emails that, or information that I need to ask the teacher, I can do it there. So in all fairness to parents, bringing in the reality to the ideal, why do we not look at that? And when we say parents aren't coming, uh, they're not showing up, that we don't factor that data in that 30%, 50%, whatever the percentage is. They are using parent view as their source. And that was really important and I've not really um, heard an answer that bridges that reality, reality <laughs> and ideal. So we were using power school, Betty at uh, Emporia High and you could track how many links, how many clicks, how many, how many, tra the traffic, if you will. Okay. And we had very low traffic. Um, the parents that wanted to check their grades, they wanted to get the instant email, were doing those. But we still had very low engagement. And we felt the relationship that you started with, let's say me, the CAP teacher, over time started to make the parents feel comfortable to be able to have the other conversations. Just because it said 10 minutes and then the open was we had a structure in place that was being kind of filled out and let's say massaged before that date. And so when you came in, you were already equipped with some of that knowledge as a parent. But the most important thing was, to be honest, to get you into the building and to have that one connection for our parents so that you felt comfortable going to the English, going to the other resources that we did have. Okay, and let me, let me qualify that because I am not specifically critiquing how sure. you know, yours is set up. It's successful, that's fantastic. I salute you, I love it. 
but there are some districts, and I am saying, when you give me data, you being any school district, how many parents are using parent view in lieu of mm. parent-teacher conference? I don't expect you to answer that. I'm suggesting yeah. that that really might be valuable information at some point, whether <coughs> it's uh, your school district is exempt, there may be another school district that heavily uses that. I would love to see us in all fairness to parents that feel they are engaged in their child's education to be represented or, or to be counted. So that's more of a, uh, I, I'd love to see us do that, more so than uh, uh, attacking you because obviously what you've set up <laughs> is <good>. great. <laughs> Yeah. It is great. Yeah. I love it. Unfortunately, that's not the reality for all districts across the state of Kansas. And to look at some ways where we could maybe factor in, even if it's 10%, that 10% still should be counted toward um, showing up for a parent-teacher conference. Um, that's a fact. That's a factor. The other part, I agree that you know the subsets or the steps that you are included are major to parents. Uh, they need to know <laughs> this information. Again, I love what you've done. Will it work everywhere? Probably not, but that's that's just life. You know, it, it works in your yeah. district, and I'm glad. Yeah, the culture in the system is probably individualized, kind of like a local school board. Yeah. You know your community, you know your setting way better than anybody right. else, but you can right. develop a culture that parents feel welcome, and you can develop a system to ensure it happens. <laughs> And so, and so to put it in perspective, you have presented an innovative way of yeah. capturing that information for your school district. And I hope, if nothing else, it just awakens in school districts that we can be innovative with our approach. We don't have to, uh, you know, look at the way you invented the wheel. Maybe sure. we can tweak it a little bit. But yeah, so I take that just as, uh, a suggestion the district should be innovative yeah. but I really would like to see them capture more uh, in, in Wichita it's parent view I don't know if that's statewide I'm not familiar but um, if there's a way that parents are interacting with students mm -hmm. to let that count for something as well yeah, sure. so that we have our facts straight yeah. but I thank you for a great um, um, presentation my next question now will be can I comment on that, Betty? Sure. It made me think uh, about Britain's system, and um, I thought it was so great just a few years ago, many more schools were making goals that said we want 100%, you know, parent participation. And I love it. I want you to reach them all, too. But in that innovation, what they did was that some parents, you may never get in, may never get in. But they would um, call them, uh, Zoom with them, any way that they could be reached. And you bet, I agree, Betty, that is a conference. That's a discussion. So how much have you used Parent View? So you go in there and look at that. What have you noticed in there? What have you seen? Did you see this? Did you see that? Those are conferences, mm -hmm. and they count, right. and they count those parents, and that would move them on toward their goal of 100%. And I believe in Britain's system, that very thing can happen too, and probably does, in terms of those parents that don't show up. You make that phone call um, and try your best to reach them and say, we missed you. You know, we uh, had you planned. We missed you. Um, do you have time to talk about your student and how they're doing, et cetera, et cetera? So in Britain's system, I think that you could account for those parents that use those systems. Yeah. Now, my next question is actually directed to you. All right. And again, <laughs> Britain, you, and again, you did, you did a, a, a super job. I, I sit and I smile, and, and I almost forget those really difficult questions I was planning to ask <laughs> to get me off track. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that I've said, and, and actually, uh, Randy, you might want to weigh in on this as well. Uh, one of the things that is a huge concern to me 
is, uh, you know, the school can be welcoming and it can do all of these great things. Does that actually align with the belief that you are preparing my student for a successful career? So I am wondering, just a thought as, as you were presenting, how we could possibly incorporate, uh, you know, not only getting their idea from being uh, uh, welcoming and, and doing all of these great things and, and keeping me posted, but what is their overall view in terms of that, that uh, educational process? Do they believe that we're preparing their kids for a future? Because again, when I was uh, talking with the, the commissioner's um, presentation, we have a big gap in the reality and ideal. And, and, and we feel as educators, we're doing all that we can to embrace student learning. And I can't imagine any one of us not wanting every kid in Kansas to be successful. But there's a communication gap because there are so many people that believe we're not doing the job that, that we're supposed to be doing. And so I have really been curious about what's their real belief about the educational institution? How do, how do you feel? I mean, you may love the school, you got a great principal, you got uh, uh, um, great support, and, and yeah, there's tutoring, and yeah, there's football, and yeah, there's all of this, but do I actually feel that my child is being prepared for the future. I'm just wondering if, you know, we may have a difference in this versus that. And I would love for us to start drilling down and finding out where this miscommunication is occurring. Because we have a lot of parents that if you talk to them not related to your, your survey, not related to these kinds of questions, but do you really feel like education is working? There's a significant number that don't, and we don't know why. Mm -hmm. And until we understand that, our hands are basically tied, and that's why I was asking you possibly to weigh in, because you reach so many of those stakeholders, the parents, that it would be so great if we could get maybe their overall perspective on education or, or um, I know that open-ended questions, if you, if you survey a thousand people, you're gonna get a thousand answers. So I know that that's kind of hard to do, but I really wonder what leads them to that perception that education is failing their kids. Just something to think about, not necessarily respond to, but that was one of the things I jotted down. And again, thank you and your assistant for such a great oh, presentation. It's lovely. <laughs> Tammy, come up here. Um, the, the one thing, um, Betty, you know, of course, um, as an answer, <laughs> big answer, but is that I think as we engage more families, as we engage more of them, can you imagine, uh, you know, families in Britain's system from high school, um, you know, they're speaking about their kid's experience and saying, you know, yeah, my child has a post-secondary goal. He's going to go to the um, vocational school. He's going to get a diesel mechanic degree. So he's taken this class, this class. He had plans laid out. And I have a feeling they would say they are meeting my child's uh, desires, his plans, his goals. So uh, in one way, the answer is family engagement. It is engagement, and it will look different from school to school. But the more we do that, um, the more parents have vocabulary or the wording to be able to say, um, like I said, for schools that are doing MTSS, I said, until your parents can explain MTSS, then it, the, the circle's not complete. 
But until a parent can say, oh my gosh, our school does this thing. I don't get it totally, but it's, I don't know, just tiered thing, triangle thing where um, they check on kids regularly. They call it progress monitoring, but they're checking on these kids and however they're doing, if they need support, they get it. They get extra. And if they really need extra support, it might be one-on-one. -on -one. And so when parents can really explain, this is what my school does for my kid and for all of our kids, they've got words to say to how good that school is supporting their kids. So um, again, engaging families, explaining, bringing them in the process. Tammy, do you have any thoughts? to extra? Sure. So I was just thinking as Britton was talking that um, one of the things that I like thinking about when I was a parent, now a grandparent, everyone likes to see their child on a field, on a stage, on a court. And so if you're looking at um, student-led conferences, then the parents are more likely to come because their child has a place in that. Um, in addition to that, there's more information um, given in situations like that than what you would see on like parent view. And so I think that that piece of it brings the families in a lot more and creates those conversations through building relationships with the students um, and staff as well. So again, just that whole idea and concept of family engagement, making sure that we're being welcoming and inviting of all families and making sure that every single student and their family has a voice. We have several more questions, uh, as, and so, but at some point we have to cut this off. <laughs> and so the, there are four questions in the queue, so I'm not going to add any after me. So when we get to the gym, we're at the end. And I will explain to my colleagues that, you know, we're never on time, and this is, this is not an exception. Uh, about 7.30, if we're still here, we'll take a supper break. <laughs> Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So I see it's an information item. Is this something that we're going to try to do with, I saw it added to one of those things with IPS. Uh, for, is it gonna be accreditation? Are we gonna be, as far as like in parent engagement, are we gonna be like, no, nothing like that. Because it's an information item. I just wanna make sure that. Um, you mean it's in terms of measuring that toward accreditation? Yeah. Now that, that would be a local strategy in order to reach but they don't, they, they aren't being like, like if parents just don't want to do it, they, they're not going to be graded on, okay, you had, you know, you only had 60% that really want to do that because you have other, you have other means of, of parent engagement and, and you'd have to prove that. I mean, you have to say, well, we're doing it this way and it works for us. Um, they're engaged. They're just not engaged in that way. So I just want to make sure that that wasn't what we were getting towards. Because I would say. True organic grassroots, I wrote this down, engagement that isn't wholly defended by the acts of this board or the Department of Education. I just want to make sure that we're not going into something where another thing we're adding to a system or district is going to have to keep track of and get back and um, fill out surveys and all that and make sure they're doing do, doing all that. Okay, that's that was my clarification. No, Michelle, but I would say the um, kudos to the KISA system in that family engagement has a rubric as a foundational structure. And the old QPA system, um, as I looked through that, I think I found the word parent or family in there maybe at the most two times, and it was in a footnote. So the KISA system and its promotion and support of engaging families is um, the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen in terms of an accreditation system because um, the family piece needs to be part of it, but it's not being monitored, it's not being counted, you know, so to speak, or anything. But the, the place that families and parents are mentioned, I think just elevates our accreditation system really across the nation. Okay, then this brings me to MTSS. If we have a, if we have a parent and you're talking about that service all that automatically is going to be there, they're tutoring their kid outside of, outside of the school. They know there is a problem. They've communicated that with their teacher. All of a sudden, somebody in the school system sees a problem, and now they're getting a program that may be, not be vetted by, it might be a federal program, it might be something that goes against the program that's outside that they're paying for tutoring services. I, I kind of saw a snapshot on one of the uh, district's websites where it looked like the parent wasn't going to be able to opt out of that. 
once that service started or once they, so I just want to make sure we're making things clear. When those services are happening, they're telling the parent, they've said, okay, we have a reading issue or we're slow, fluency issue, whatever it is, that's where the school needs to notify the parent and say, okay, we'll have them, well, then they say, well, we already knew that. We are, you know, is that the communication we're looking for? Or Because if you get one thing, then that doesn't mean those services have to happen at that school. They can happen outside of the, outside in refer, into a referred out basis, which is maybe they're paying for that, and it's a, and it's a different kind of a system. Do you have an answer to that? <laughs> well, well, I think the part that I understand, maybe Britain has more, I don't know, more input on it, but um, when, a, when as a, if a school is implementing MTSS, it is something that where the students are monitored closely. And so then if they need those extra supports, then they have a structure in place. And I totally agree with you that it is talked about with the parents first. We would like to give Jeremiah, Jose, um, uh, according to the data, because they're progress monitoring. So they look at the data, and we have a concern here. So we would like to give Jose extra support, 30 minutes a day, or whatever. And I, I'm no MTSS um, expert, but boy, they could talk to you and really explain it beautifully. But that system, MTSS, I know them, and it is family, inform them first, inform them first. Just because you inform them doesn't mean, though, that that person that's doing the, the work on that, they could be awesome, they could be great, they could be a professional in the system, but it doesn't mean that that service, it might conflict with the service, like I'm saying, is being done outside of, uh, outside of the school. Right? I'm talking about, like, literacy for one. There's a lot of programs out there that are dysfunctional, they're not vetted, they're federal, um, and then they're conflicting with something that's working great in a local level or outside of the local level or in that community that they've set aside uh, for services to offer to those parents. So I just want to make sure when we're talking about that that parent can say, I'm sorry, stop that, stop that um, monitoring or whatever you're doing because we've, we've got this as a parent. We're outside of the system. We're doing something differently, and we don't want that. I would just say, like, I'm just going to go back to two years ago, Fontness and Pinnell. We're going with science of reading, and then we're going to whole language. If you're doing something that's fighting the brain or fighting whatever's going on with that child and their, and their memory and what they're, what they're doing with literacy, and it's, and it's harming what we're doing and we're paying for outside of the system, I just want to make sure those things are very clear and the parent can say, stop everything, opt out, do not, do not have my child continue that program. Hopefully those relationships you know, are established like that so that that can happen. Those sharing power discussions and sharing advocacy, those standards, that that can happen. That only happens if we've got good relationships, built on trust, built on trust. Yep, I love that approach. Yeah, keeping communication with parents is just common sense. If you think, do they need to know? The answer is yes. Yeah. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Thank you for the presentation. This is awesome. Um, I'm trying to stay on topic here and get us on time. That's, so when that's, we, a, that's fruitless. <laughs> <laughs> when we think about parent engagement, I think about the different kinds of communication. Um, and I want to kind of, I want to take a step back and set the record straight real quick. You made some assumptions. I heard, I've heard some different assumptions today. Um, so I want to make it a point to say we are not experts in IPS. And in fact, every district seems to be doing something wildly different when it comes to IPS. Um, Betty made a comment about the system that her district uses, Parent View. Um, it seems that almost every district seems to have a different system for communicating with parents as well. So as a parent, I might get emails. I might use Skyward. I might use um, Canvas. Parent View is not something that exists in my district. So there's, there's disparity in the way that we go about implementing these different tools. And we talk a lot about IPS here. We've had conversations as a board about the need for rigorous IPS. So I like that you're pulling the IPS in kind of as that, that carrot to get parents to show up for those conferences and be engaged. I'll skip part of my question and go to the end. Can you talk to me about the CAPS teacher? And I'm, I'm hearing something that I don't see in my district. Is that a required class for every student? What does that look like exactly? And how do you fit that? <coughs> I'm going to jump to tomorrow. How do you fit that into your graduation requirements? So we, we call it the microphone, please. 
there's we, three people listening. <laughs> yeah, we called Spartan Success, which which is aligns with our CAP teachers, so career and academic planning. Um, I showed a few slides there, but essentially setting a structure that would establish the teaching of the individual plan of study, the exposure of you know my career interests, my skills. What does that look like if in a career after high school, mm -hmm. and then that alignment with my course selections. A lot of times when you go and enroll, they just go, hey, you know, Randy's in this class and Janet's, in, I really want to take that class. Well, so we got away from that and we started to have you select classes that would align with that individual plan of study. And so we were intentional during that Monday through Thursday, that hour, we carved out. We thought it was so important. We gave kids credit. It was a pass fail. But we also did, um, you know, some uh, self-regulation during that time. So we developed self-regulation strategies and lessons. We had a CAP committee that designed those for the whole staff, so that way it was consistent. We didn't make our teachers do 100 different lesson plans. We did a lesson plan for freshmen, sophomore, et cetera. Um, and then we also did life skills in there. And so those life skills of how to change a tire, how to balance a checkbook. And so all those things were embedded within that Spartan success. But the most important thing was to start to figure out what you as the student wanted to do so we could drive your education and involve your parent. Because the video that I didn't get to show you, those parents are just like you and I. Well, I'm not real sure how to help with some of these things, but I do care about this. I want to know what my kid's going to do and what level of success they're going to have when they leave here. What are their possibilities? What are they excited about? Because I know not always my junior in college is telling me, right? So I have to really engage. I'm busy, Dad. You don't understand. And so those things we specifically structured month by month, year by year, in that rubric I kind of showed you to make sure that we, when you left our system over that four-year span, you had this amount of exposure to reflect on your skills and interest. Okay. So quick follow-up, if I may. What is your motivation then at the system level to continue to get better at IPS? Because you've checked the box. You've, they've done Zello. You've had the conversation, box checked, you've got an IPS, why get better? Can, you, can you align that to higher graduation rates? Yeah, did you see the graduation rate I showed you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still have about 8% that didn't have success. We had about 55% that didn't meet their post-secondary goal. We still have work to do. Um, I don't think you ever get there per se, but um, that drive that, that you want to get better and not leave one behind, um, I, I don't know if that's for everybody, if certainly for us. And, and that's important. And so I don't think you ever get to the point where you're like, man, we're done, right? But I do think you get to the point where our culture says that, you know, if it's working great, we keep it. If it doesn't, we're going to tweak it until we continue to reach more kids, more engagement, higher success. But um, unfortunately, we just never got there. No, that was our goal. But yeah. It's tremendous work that yeah. you're doing. Thank you so much. And I love that you have tied in that life skills opportunity you're checking some boxes that I'm hearing from students, this is what we want, so nice work. Sidebar, but uh, our uh, counselor would bring his lawnmower and, and you know, we didn't do this in every setting, but change the oil in the lawnmower, a lot, of, a lot of kids would never get to do that. But. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm good, Mr. Chair, thank you. Jim, I'll make this quick. Uh, thanks for what you do. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a function of leadership on how well the school will com connect with parents and community. I, I hate to say that, but it's, it's on the principal's shoulders. And regrettably, and the superintendent, but regrettably, we have shortages. And regrettably, those individuals don't stay in their positions very long, except in situations like Emporia. You guys are there forever. <laughs> no, they are. No, you, you've had great stability over the, over the 30 years I've worked with you, you know. Yeah. But many districts don't have that. You know, and it, it, in many ways, a lot of administrators go to these districts and don't know it's really their responsibility. You know, so thank you for what you do because you're a role model as we can do it here and hopefully that will spread and others will find out that this is, can have success and the success will be ultimately the students. So thank you for what you do. Good job. Thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation. We will reconvene at 325.
Oh, uh, I didn't write that down, so remind me, is it B, C, D, and E? C, D, and yeah, F, or C, D? Yeah, the only ones were A and B were the only ones I'm certain. So we're pulling C, D, E, and F. C, D, E, and F. The motion would be in order to approve the consent agenda minus C, D, E, and F. Michelle and Dina. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Motion would be in order to approve the consent agenda, B, C, D, and no. C, B, C, D, E, and F. Is that right? Dina and Dan. <coughs> All in favor? All opposed? All right, nine to one. No, oh, thank you. And now, the chair's report. Is there any additional travel? Get to my notes here. <coughs> Our next item is to act on appointments to the Professional Practices Commission. Is that where you're you're here for that? Okay, a motion to be in order to approve the travel as Dina and Jim. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Okay, and I don't have my notes on the appointments to the Professional Practices Commission, so let me find that. Yeah, I don't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not here. So. Yeah. Okay, I move. Uh, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve the recommended amendments to the Kansas State uh, Board? No. So I, okay, that's what Randy told me. I'm following directions. <laughs> 10B. Is that 10B? I withdraw my motion. Okay, now this is, there are three people that are nominated and we have to choose. And how many do we choose? Who are they? So walk us through this. We have to, we have to identify who we're going to choose. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, and I'm you just may. here to help kind of clarify in case you have questions about the way that we solicited nominations. Currently, we have two open seats on the Professional Practices Commission. Based on the members that currently sit, um, we solicited nominations for anyone that satisfied, I'll just say, an at-large classroom teacher position. We've already satisfied the minimum other teaching positions, if that makes sense. So really, any level of teacher would be appropriate. Uh, we, I believe you have four nominees. We're asking you to select two. Because this, these individuals act as jurors on licensure cases, the agency does not make recommendations for you. Um, I think it'd be appropriate that I'd point out in the call for nominees, the agency indicated, and this was at my request, a, a request that 
I should say a preference will be given for those that represent dis school districts that are not already represented. Sometimes we may have six or seven PPC members that show up for hearings, <coughs> and if you have more than one on the same school district, and yet you have an individual from that school district whose case is being heard, they are not required, but we ask them to recuse themselves if they even work in that same district. And when you have to recuse multiple people from the same district, it makes it difficult to have a quorum. But again, there's different ways to achieve diversity. Uh, that was just one level we were trying to make it easier to, to proceed. And, and with that, we'll defer. Shane Carter is here. He can, he can tell you more if you want to know which state board member districts are represented by which position. In other words, he can tell you what board districts are being replaced if you'd like to know that if it's not already in your packet. Okay, so Claire Breckenridge represents District 8. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. And Leanne Rogers rec uh, is District 3. Ricardo Sanchez is District 9, New District 9. And Shane Henry is? Shared between 1 and 4. Yeah, 4. From, from Lawrence School District. Oh. OK, I've slept since I've read this. Do we have the list of where? Do you have the list of current members? Yes, I do. What, uh, what districts are not represented? Well, I'll start with who we're replacing. So okay. uh, the, the two positions that are replacing, one is Board District 2, and the other is Board District 8. Uh, we currently have representation from uh, Board Districts 5, 1, 7, 8, 10, 1, 2, 7, and 4. So representation of all districts is, is included in there. Okay. And we do have some eight not recommended board district eight individuals that are here that could move into the replacement for eight if you so chose, if you choose to move in that manner. Okay, Ben. So <clears throat> the spot that's open on the PPC when it says Wichita is currently on there mm -hmm. is going off. Correct. No. no. Well, eight. Hold on. But one of the nominees is from USD 259. Yes, that is correct. And we already have somebody on the PPC from USD 259 who is not that, going off, correct? Correct. Okay, so that would be two people from the same school district, and that's what we're trying to avoid. I know Wichita is huge. Right. But one's in an administrator position, and this is a teacher position. If factor that, include that in there as but well. But do we ask them to recuse themselves if they work for the same district, regardless of their position? Yes. Okay, so it would not behoove us to appoint somebody else from 259. I mean... This is a policy statement, not something you should answer. So, <laughs> uh, for me, that. So, with that. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. I was. I want clarification before you make well, a motion. Well, can I you're make a make, motion? You're going to make That's a motion. Fine. Make the motion. Ahead. Yeah, because we can still have a motion. Um, I move that the Kent State Board of Re Education act to appoint Lee Ann Rogers to serve on the Professional Practices Commission representing the public school classroom teacher at large position. The appointed nominee would serve the partial term effective November 15th, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. Is there a second to that motion? Melanie seconds that motion. Betty. Okay, I, you were saying some things that got a little clouded. You said a, one of the positions that's being replaced is from District 8? So there it, were... There Previously, there were two individuals that were... Uh, on the board or on the commission that were from District 8. One was a uh, administrator, middle-level principal position, and the other was a teacher position. Okay. And it, it almost sounded as though you were saying there was a problem with having... Yes. There are times that if you ha as you said, Wichita is a large school district. I don't mean to pick on Wichita. But when you have more than one PPC member from the Wichita School District, which we had, and then you have a teacher or an administrator that we've filed a complaint against. If we ask the PPC members to recuse themselves because that teacher either wants to work or does work in Wichita, now instead of having one person recuse, you have two people recused. 
so there's fewer people you have. It's just I'm trying to avoid that happening okay. in the future. And I, I'm, how often was that a problem? I guess I'm trying to, I, I don't follow, since you had Yeah, it, it was a problem before frequently. that I'm trying to avoid. Okay, and. <clears throat> or that I should say, I'm asking you to help me avoid. It's entirely uh, up to you. Okay, and let me uh, backtrack. Was there a district when you read off uh, each district was there a district that was not represented? Yeah, we I have, don't believe I have one. Three. There are there are three districts no, that. No, no, four district three is not represented. Okay, do we have someone from? That's the one that was just nominated. District yes. three. Okay, so that's the one, and then there would be one remaining. And I'm just cool. trying to get clarity. Uh, not picking on anything, yeah. but I do need clarity. So the nomination he just made was for District 3, and then we would follow up with whomever the second person is. Is that correct? Correct. And is there, is there a current representative from District 9? Uh, 6 and 9, there's not a, okay. a current representative. Okay. I apologize. Okay, My the motion is for... Uh, the motion was for Leanne Rogers. I and mean, that motion has been made and seconded. Is there any more discussion on that particular nomination? If not, all in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Uh, is that you again, Ben? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education Act to appoint Ricardo Sanchez to serve on the Professional Practices Commission, representing a public school classroom teacher at large position. The appointed nominee would serve a partial term effective November 15th, 2022 through June 30th, 2024. Is there a second to that motion? Dina seconds that motion. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Nine and one. Thank you. Committee reports. If you have a committee report, uh, please uh, step forward. Um, uh, NASB conference in Phoenix uh, as your delegate and Dina and I had a great time in Phoenix um, uh, a lot of really good information Dina did a really nice summary that I encourage you guys to read um, uh, which I was very glad because I've been home a whopping three days uh, we, we got legislative lays and stuff done in Phoenix so it was really nice uh, to, to knock that out while we were there um, a lot of great sessions. Dina filled it up really nicely. Uh, we are excited to announce that uh, Sarah Moore from Arkansas will be the was elected chair elect at our delegate assembly, um, and she will secede Chris Benson, uh, who is now the chair from Illinois. Uh, Janet Kenna from Utah is immediate past chair, uh, and we also elected Tiffany. I just lost her last name from Michigan um, as our new central area director. From Mich oh no, she's on the nominations committee. It was Nebraska. It was um, not Patsy. It was the other one. Sorry. It was yeah, um, um, yeah. It's in the it's in the report. I just lost her last name. Um, uh, Patty from Nebraska is our new central area director. Uh, for that, Tiffany is the central area representative to the nominations committee. I ran that meeting. You think I would remember? Uh, of which Dina served as your delegate for our central area directors meeting since I was asked to chair that meeting uh, of the Central Area Directors since the our one from Michigan, Pamela could not be there uh, from Michigan. So uh, a lot of great input. Uh, I think my favorite session was definitely one on, on industry recognized certifications and, and outcomes and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of really good data uh, to use from a study in Texas uh, on that. So um, it was a lot of really great information and those that weren't there missed out on a wonderful time and a lot of good info. But I do want to point out that our attorneys were there. Mark was wonderful and, and our own Scott, he just left, Scott and former employee Michelle presented a thing on teacher licensure uh, that I attended as well. So we had some good representation and good presentations. Okay, thank you, Ann. Thank you, the um, Advisory Council on um, Indigenous Education 
continues to meet. We'll meet two more times this year, and then I think next year uh, we're going to move to once a month or once a quarter. And um, we talked about when it would move to a permanent um, committee, and I think what I told you last month uh, is probably about right about the middle of next year. We ought to be settled. We'll have our out-of-state representatives on board. Right now, uh, we're working mostly on um, recommendations for data collection to better identify where indigenous students are attending to try to help and uh, with uh, Title VI funds um, so we can get some more of those. And um, also um, working on curriculum. That'll be a, a big lift there, but we have a lot of good ideas from around the country we can draw from, and we certainly don't intend to uh, reinvent the wheel on that. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to visit with them. Okay, thank you. Dina. Ma, I do not have a question. I wanted to uh, tag on to Ben's report. Just, is that okay if sure. I do that now? Yes. Okay, the um, booklet that says Opportunity to Learn, Responsibility to Lead is from NASBE. And it, there was a presenter from the Aspen Institute. So this is research that they have conducted. And uh, there just happened to be a lot of them laying around on tables. And I picked them up and thought it would be a good thing to uh, share with all of you. So that's where that booklet came from. Okay. Just an FYI. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any co other committee reports? If not, Mark. Whoa, there it is, sorry. Um, my report, uh, I submitted uh, my monthly report and in the uh, in the report, I included the agenda for uh, for attendance at the Nicosia uh, conference, which is in combination with uh, NASB, and the Nicosia is the acronym for National Council of State Education Attorneys. Quite a few um, states were represented. Um, it it was a good conference. It's always a good opportunity to hear what's occurring in other states. Uh, the challenge is is that each state. Um, talks about at the beginning kind of explains how their um, their state agency and state board is comprised and uh, for every state it was very unique and diversely different in the sense of whether they the attorneys are, are part of the attorney general office whether they're part of the agency whether they are an appointed body or um, you know each for each state it was so uniquely different that it was, um, um, it, it's always interesting to see how the different states uh, coordinate and cooperate uh, with the different um, um, divisions of the government. Um, at the beginning of the conference, they typically go do a round table um, and open mic to discuss issues and concerns. And of the 35 people attending uh, the most common things that they were dealing with. Um, some, some states were dealing with uh, charter school issues, but uh, the theme seemed to be parents' rights, um, you know, library books and things that were, uh, and data privacy and security and issues that were, um, I, I guess, a little bit surprising to me in the sense that the absence of any topics that states were dealing with related to um, school safety and guns in schools and some of the things that had been had dominated the discussion in previous years just sim simply weren't weren't present and they also weren't on the agenda maybe that's because in previous years we you know we've talked about it but um, when when the attor various attorneys from each state uh, talked about those being the kind of front line issues um, those were not the kinds of things that that uh, were being discussed, and I found that just a little bit surprising, I guess. Um, so kind of a, the pendulum swinging back around from 
where it's been in, in uh, previous uh, previous uh, cycles. Um, we did, uh, yeah, so I set out the agenda and it goes through all of the different topics. One thing that I, and, and this is more just a commentary, um, you know, the data sharing agreements, I know that that's something that Scott and the agency have had to wrestle with a lot and, and uh, put a lot of importance on that. I had a little bit of an aha moment because sometimes I think, sometimes I ask the question, you know, why is it so such a emphasis? Because what's the what? Uh, obviously, you want to protect data privacy, um, uh, data uh, from involving students and families. But I've I've never heard it kind of get to the to the base level as to why that's a concern. And somebody shared that that the um, the the information is that the fraud and abuse targets schools and school districts and education uh, institutions, not because, not just because they collect so much data, but because um, they are targeted specifically for the purpose that if you get the identifiable information and commit fraud, because, this, because um, students are younger and aren't going to later, aren't going to be perhaps applying for loans or uh, engaging in commerce that their background check would um, would show a hit for a fraudulent activity. The, the gap between the, the incident of fraud and the detection of fraud is so much different than in other areas. And that was kind of a light bulb moment for me because I was like, okay, I see the, the, the connection as to why. Um, not that I would give light to sharing that information, but it shows that the the incident of attempts upon uh, data uh, for education agencies and institutions that's the purpose behind the the criminal intent to target that and so I, that was the first I had heard as to the answer to to why um, we did hear uh, a, a great uh, hour long uh, debate and presentation uh, between Scott Gordon and Dr. Michelle Miller. Uh, and uh, it was both informative, uh, entertaining, and um, uh, educational about the, the topic that they had was uh, licensure. Uh, you know, was it? You know, what is it good for? Debating the need for state licensing requirements, and they had uh, presented at a previous conference, and then uh, um, brought that to the to the Nicosia conference and set it up in a point counterpoint um, proposal or where they debated, uh, had an open debate and engaged in discussion with uh, all of the attendees. Uh, and it was, it was a great presentation. Um, attended all of the sessions and uh, uh, networked and get, get uh, the resources and get the benefit of the list serves from lawyers who are um, uh, around the country who may be facing similar issues to the state board or the, the agency. Um, there was also an interesting presentation on uh, not just the, the content or the cases of the U.S. Supreme Court update, but one of the mains, uh, the attorney from the state of Maine argued a case uh, this year in front of the, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. So she had some real insight that was kind of um, was was uh, fun for as other other uh, lawyers. Um, I it was a good conference. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see uh, our board members as much. But as it should be, the, the lawyers were put off and and, and and separated far and away, so we didn't pollute your conference. But uh, so we we didn't cross paths as much, except at at, uh, at the common breakfast. Um, and then the only other thing is to follow up, I guess, on the the constitutional amendment that in Kansas that I, uh, con I previously reported on, at least currently that's by slim margin is um, being, is currently losing, but I, I don't believe it's been certified as a final vote, uh, but that co constitutional amendment and the topic there was the, uh, was uh, uh, related to um, regulations, invalidating regulations that might be passed, not just by the governor's office, but by government, by uh, gubernatorial agencies. And so that uh, I previously reported on, on that. Um, the other, I guess the only other 
ripple effect that I feel um, is relevant to kind of the legal issues that you might encounter is, you know, anytime a surrounding state um, passes, med passes recreational marijuana, it, it occurs to me that, uh, you know, whether, whether I'm advising employers generically or certainly dealing with schools and uh, educational institutions, and which are some of the largest employers um, in any community, uh, the issue, and which will then tr migrate more and more towards licensing, is the issue of, you know, crossing the state line, particularly in the Kansas City metropolitan area, where you're going to be able to very soon. There and the, the, the news this morning was focused on, you know, when you would actually be able to buy uh, recreational marijuana in the Kansas City area, and they were targeting that it would be up and running and and. Uh, available by the time of the Super Bowl, so, you know, fe mid-February of 2023. So regardless of how you feel about that, the, the legal implication is, is that it will be a question for employers and districts and ultimately licensure whether or not um, y your ability to cross the state line and participate in a legal activity and then come back into the state of Kansas you know what? What is the significance of that? Are you are you violating a company policy, or you know, or and and also the constitutional amendment in the state of Missouri uh, deals with um, uh, being able to absolve them of those uh, prior crimes, and so um, the nonviolent uh, drug offenses, and so those are some things that I think will trickle down and and uh, impact the board. Um, uh, based on the election yesterday, the results of the election in, in another state. Okay, thank you. Questions for Mark? If not, future agenda items, there's a couple of things that, uh, that I want to, uh, to address. First of all, if you recall this morning during, uh, during the, uh, or this, I guess this afternoon, during the uh, session, we were asked, you know, the presentation for the second time about consent. Uh, I'm going to give a little history. The first thing I did whenever I was appointed or whenever I was elected to the Board of Education, I was assigned uh, the uh, uh, Emergency Safety Intervention Task Force. What happened was that for the last several years before that, the board had had several presentations about safety interventions. The board had developed guidelines. Uh, and in my view, and this is in retrospect, that it didn't take as seriously the issue as, as was taken by others. And so this was imposed upon us and we had to deal with it. Uh, and we should have dealt with it uh, because it was an issue. Uh, people have been talking about dyslexia for years, and finally, whenever a legislative, the legislature developed a task force, we stepped forward and took, took that. Uh, I hesitate to look like we're ignoring anything that comes to us, because in my view, I've been preaching to my kids and kids that come to my house for years about the dangers of obsessive relationships. And I would think that, uh, that this issue uh, needs to be addressed, but I think that the best place to address it would be to ask the department and whatever, and I don't know what the right department would be, to actually make some recommendations, uh, maybe in health or whatever it is, so wh whatever the appropriate about how we might be able to help school district address these issues. Is that reasonable? Uh, because it's important, I think, when people come to us with legitimate concerns that we take those legitimate concerns seriously. And quite frankly, uh, in the 15, 20 years ago when I was out uh, taking pot shots at the State Board of Education, you know, as a practitioner, uh, I was critical of those in our positions for not taking things seriously enough. Ann? Well, I was looking at the health standards and it's not that it's not in there. Responsible behaviors are, healthy relationships are there, uh, refusal skills are already there. 
um, you know, what's a healthy and an unhealthy relationship, but, but there's not a lot of, I mean, those standards are in our standards, but maybe we need to just develop some resources to support those standards, but it, it's there. I just think it's important for us to officially address it. Absolutely, but and maybe see if the resources are there. And it, I mean, we probably have a lot of stuff available. It's not on our website too. But um, I think, yeah, we do need to address it and answer it. But you know, to say it's not there at all, just yeah, that's okay. not true either. So, with some clarification and some support, I'm sure would be in order. And thank you for that. And uh, I was unable to go to the conference for. Uh, for some previous uh, issues, but I was assigned this book by Ann that was available at the conference, uh, and it uh, about how high poverty schools are becoming high performance schools, and if we are a as our goal, as we've discussed, needs to be making sure that we move children. Out of this, out of level one, we need to have a plan and resources to help schools do that. And I, you know, I, Randy talked about that this morning. I think we need to get very serious about that. And if you haven't read this book, I'd suggest you do it uh, because it's because uh, uh, I mean I'm afraid of Anne and she assigned this to me, so I, so I did it. But it, it's very enlightening and. And the in, in, important thing, it, it has many, many practical suggestions, and it also has many examples of how school districts that have <laughs> students that are high poverty school districts has taken the, the initiative to turn those schools around and transform them so that students are doing well. And none of it deals with scholarships to private schools. That's, that's not part of the process. The part of the process is that you, that you take uh, that you understand the impact of poverty and that you make the assumptions, you, you make the, 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 uh, the strategies necessary to address those concerns and that you do not have lower expectations uh, for any student, that you have high expectation and you hold everybody accountable, including the leadership and the people, the professionals in the school. Anne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm hoping we can maybe have that discussion next month. I thought the thing that was most encouraging about this is now we have research that shows that the strategies we laid out for schools in KISA and in, in our board goals, are they work. Because in their top 10 strategies, most of those, like the first thing is to make sure kids are physically and emotionally secure. That's number one. There's equity in there. There's an emphasis on literacy, top academic skills. So a lot of the things they identified as research-based and work are things we already promote. So if it's not happening, then we know schools aren't doing what we're asking them to do because we know when they do it, it works. So I, I hope we can have that, that discussion real soon. Okay. Thank you. I believe, Michelle, you had some. Oh, Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Porter. So um, uh, we, we discussed earlier, we were talking about NAEP scores and how that's specific, uh, tar specifically targeted, which parents, a lot of parents don't understand that. Um, the validity between what's going on in the classroom with acquiring knowledge, which is true education, or an assessment that's actually done on a kid based off of a MAP testing or assessment at the state board. What, what are the, not the state board, but the state assessments. What, what's the difference? Tell the parents, like, if we can talk about so what they're hearing out there and then what, you know, they, they just have to, it has to be like their own judgments. Like, okay, th this is what's going on with my child and I'm happy with, with, with what's going on with my child. Even though they may have failed at a state assessment or didn't do as well with those scores, I think we just need to make sure that we explain to the parents what those are. Because there, there's a lot of confusion out there in the differences between the two. And then I didn't know if you have been receiving, I talked to uh, Attorney John, uh, Scott Gordon about the hearing that we're having in December about the 99-page document that was in Rules and Regs back at the legislative on, eight, on the 18th. I, I, I had heard that there was going to be a hearing in December. Yeah. So, so um, and he was telling me the people that were, were that went out to or have that 99-page document, which would be like the NEA, USA, maybe KNEA, um, I, it didn't, KSAB has that document. 
It's out on the website under legislation, under rules and regs. So there's a lot in it, and there are maps in it, and it just seems like we're we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. So in the next in the next two months, so kind of with with like with Keisha, if they're supposed to be sending those e emails to you so that all of the board can read them, I got a lot of emails on the Keisha ruling after our hearing. We had a hearing, then we had about 30 days. I had to respond and re react to the across the state to emails that I got personally. And I don't know, those are, they just came to me personally. They weren't addressed to, it didn't look like they were addressed to the rest of the board. Now they may have copied or and blindly copied everybody. But so I'm wanting to know, are, have you received one email? Do they understand it? And he said they may not understand it because it's a lot of stuff between the Attorney General's office and the, and the, and, and, and an attorney at the Kansas State Board of Education. And it's on teacher licensure. So, so if I get a question on that, I won't even know because you're not even going to propose those until two weeks before the next meeting. Then there's a hearing, and then what would we, when would we be voting on that? Then that day, or would we on the 13th, or in the next month, Randy? Let me uh, let me see if I can get Scott back here. To yeah, answer some well, he of your didn't. He did, I asked, and he didn't have a lot of he didn't have a lot of information for me. He said it's probably very confusing, and they don't. It's a lot of um, attorney stuff, and they wouldn't really necessarily understand it or be able to dissect it. So I, if I can't explain it to my constituents or a teacher that may reach out to me on teacher licensure for the future for 99 pages, they might want to, that might want to be out there because it's out there on the PDF file under rules and regs in legislation on the 10-18 uh, meeting. It was a long, there were lots of committees going on that day and I just happened to catch it because the senator said, hey, you might want to watch this. And I watched it, and then I went out and all those things. So there's there's multiple levels here, I think, that we need to understand. So, <laughs> and I've asked Scott if he can come back. And Ann, you might check to see if he's still. Oh, there he is. So Scott went over to a legislative uh, committee that oversees regulations um, to kind of talk about our process. But can can you just kind of fill in? Uh, what's going on, and then the, the back and forth with the Attorney General's office and kind of where we're at. So here's where we're at now. Um, this, this set of licensure regs started way back in, I think, 2019, maybe been 2017. It March, like Mar March 2018, because you had said it was, because I emailed you and you said it was, mm -hmm. you had voted on it, but then you said, I have to make a correction. You didn't vote on that. That was that back in 2018. Okay. Then it went back and forth the last 18 months between Attorney General's office and the administration and Department of Education. That's a lot. There's a lot in that, though. And I just want to make sure yes, that the teachers are aware of what's... There is a lot in there, and it will not affect 99% of the teachers in Kansas. It just won't. Uh, most of the language will not affect anyone um, because all we did was move paragraph A to paragraph B. Um, Here's, here's what's going to happen next month, uh, if I may. So yeah, the process is always, and I know many of you have sat through this several times. Uh, back in 2018, the State Board of Education approved and authorized the agency to send certain changes to the licensure regulations through the formal adoption process. In that time, I believe it was the end of 2019, there were a couple of other substantive changes, one of which was the creation of a limited use license. The other one was the creation of the driver's ed endorsement. So we added those into the license regs that were already in process. It was a good stopping point, if you will. Uh, it takes time getting those approved from the Department of Administration and the attorneys at the AG's office. Uh, there was a comment during the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules and Regs that why did it take 18 months to get this page stamped? I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, it just, it takes some time sometimes. Uh, but we followed the correct process. Announcement for the public hearing, was that was published about a month ago because we have October to publish 6th. that. It was October 6th. Okay. So it will have it's exactly, I think, 60 days, which is what, what the public needs, I guess. Yes. So it was published and announced at least 60 days prior to your public hearing. You as a board will have the public hearing on Tuesday of your December meeting. It's going to be very similar to the Keisha hearing that you just did. 
uh, or that you just held. Essentially, Chairman Porter will bang his gavel and say that the hearing is open. Anyone who wishes to speak on the proposed regulations will have the opportunity to do that. Anyone that has questions or concerns that they want addressed can email those to Barbara. Her email address is included in the, in the formal publication. I have no idea if you've received any or not. Okay, she hasn't received any yet. You might now. Um, Sorry about that. So that's, too, that's, there's a lot. That's there's a lot right. in there. Yes, it's, it is voluminous. That, that is uh, absolutely accurate. As Mark pointed out, I had a lengthy conversation with Michelle about this for like four and a half years. Point being, so that will go however long you want to allow that to happen on Tuesday. It depends on how many people show up, right? Wednesday morning, then the agency will provide a response. And it's mostly going to be myself and Shane Carter. We will respond to any of the questions or comments that uh, may have come up during your conversation on Tuesday. We will respond to any written comments that uh, Barbara may receive, as well as the comments that were received um, from, the, from JCAR. And then you all will have questions and concerns that we will address at that time. Someone will hopefully make a motion to adopt the regulations. Someone will second that. And then you will vote individually whether or not to adopt the regulations. If there are no substantive changes to the regulations from when they were seen by the Joint Committee, then we don't have to go back through the entire process. We can just make those changes and make uh, and adopt them. If there are substantive changes, if you decide, you know what, I don't like that part. We're not going to accept that part. Um, and you adopt a different version of it, then we go back and essentially start the process over um, with whatever changes you ask us to put into the regulations. When I say, by the way, and I'm, I'm somewhat editorializing, that most of the changes were not going to affect the teachers, uh, Unless you're asking for a driver's education endorsement, you don't care what that endorsement requirement is. Unless you are asking for a limited purpose license, that's not going to affect you. Most of the changes are, I don't want to be unfair, uh, we changed some of the terminology and what certain licenses were, would cover and what they were called to update them with how they're actually used in the field and, and how they're discussed in higher education. That was probably the biggest change to these licensure regulations. And there are some deadline, there were some, some time limits about, originally you could only use a sub license for 60 days, I think we bumped it up to 90, or it went from 30 to 45. Keep in mind those deadlines, that was started in 2018, we didn't have any of the changes that you all have wanted to make on sub licenses. So those will not be reflected at all in, uh, in these regs. So that's what's gonna happen. And if you want me to, I mean, you can have the proposed regulations now if you want them and share them with the world. It doesn't really matter. Um, you can, I'll, I'll send those to, to Barbara and she can somehow make it available to whomever. I don't think it makes much of a, it's, it, yes, we can do that if you'd like. Back in 2018, we, we approved them. That is and, correct. And Every change. And it's taken this long for it to get back to us. Yes. Mr. Chairman, if, if they are that voluminous and just because of timing, maybe we should, uh, I'd recommend that we just circulate them to the board in advance. They're gonna be in the board pack. I mean, the, the information will be, it's already available, but just to provide more yeah. lead time to review it. And since the questions come up, perhaps you could circulate yeah. those. The actual regulatory language, and Michelle had asked me during the break, you know, are we still working on them? No, they're done. We've published them in the Kansas Registrar. We made it available to others. We can put it on a billboard, I, whatever. No, let's make it available. That'd be a big billboard, but we could do it. <laughs> let's not do that. But okay. But make it available to us. Okay, anything sure. else? Dina, is this, uh, did, I, did I not remove the last time, or is this new? I see that you had. Well, I uh, just wanted to reiterate my thought that we needed more information on chronic absenteeism and uh, including perhaps how it is being reported 
uh, dealt with through KISA and uh, that and what the what the agency is doing to um, what knowledge they have about each district's issue with with chronic absenteeism and if they are able to give support to those school districts when they indeed have an issue. Okay. Or is it excused? Is it excused as absentee? You know, because you <laughs> might be sick and then you have two excused absences and that just happened to fall in that month where you were maybe sick for a week and then you also had something that was prearranged with the family or whatever and you were leaving, leaving town or out of state or something. So excused absences as well, like were they, did, they, did you call in and prearrange that with the school? Or are these just people that aren't showing up and we have no idea where they are? Well, there's, there's, you know, there are a whole bunch of reasons for absences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and if indeed it turns out that the school you were talking about with your grandchildren, it seems to me the district should come up with some sort of a solution to assist that family in acquiring the kind of tutoring to keep those children updated. That the kind of chronic absenteeism that the school district was talking about was, oh, I don't feel like going to school today. And so parents are just sort of like, well, it's not going to make a difference if it's just a day or two. But that happens monthly. So that's the kind of thing I'm really talking about. But I think we also need to emphasize if children have medical issues, there needs to be support for them as well. Okay, so. anything else on future agenda items? Thank you. If not, for those of you in the audience, we are going to have two executive sessions. We normally do not have executive sessions, so this is extremely unusual. The first one is going to be for uh, the purpose of conferring with our attorney, and the second will be for non-elected personnel. Uh, we will not make, when we come back into session, uh, the second time, because we'll come back, we'll, we come back between the two sessions because we, they're not for the same purpose, we have to, we have to actually have that motion for the second executive session. We are making no decisions, and when we come back that last time, the only thing we will do is recess until tomorrow morning. So, Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education recess into executive session to discuss the subject of, uh, of potential litigation, pending litigation, pending litigation, uh, legal matters with legal counsel, which is justified pursuant to the uh, exception for matters which which would be deemed privileged by the in the attorney-client relationship uh, under coma, in order to promote, in order to protect the uh, privilege. Oh, darn it! I can't believe this. The privilege and the board board's communication with uh, with a, an attorney on legal matters. This session will begin at. Yeah, 25, because we, we just had a break, so we don't... 425? Yeah. For how long? That's what, I think 30 minutes will catch it. For 30 minutes, and we'll resume in this room at 450, 4, yeah, 55, right? 455. Uh, Mark Ferguson, Randy Watson, Scott Gordon, uh, Ben Proctor, and Craig Nineswander are invited to attend to join this executive session.
Is there a second to the motion? Melanie seconds the motion. All in favor? All opposed? Thank you. We will reconvene in three minutes. Uh, those of you in the audience are asked to, uh, to leave.
I move that the Kansas State Board of Education recess into executive session to discuss the subject of an individual employee's uh, performance, which justified, which is justified pursuant to the non-elected person personnel personnel exceptions under coma in order to protect the innocent, the privacy interest of the individual to be discussed. The session will begin at five o'clock. Five o'clock for 20 minutes and uh, will no action will be taken during the session and the open meeting will resume in the boardroom at 520. A second to that motion. Jim Dickens that motion. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Tell us when we're clear, Eric.
this till nine o'clock in the morning.